welcome everyone uh, to the fourth annual uh, Molecular Pathology and Genomics Symposium here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, for the second year in a row, we are partnering with the Division of Computational Pathology um, to host this symposium. Uh, our topic uh, focus this, uh, for this year is going to be on the applications of mass spectrometry. Uh, both the basic science um, and translational uh, research applications, as well as the potential uh, implications for um, clinical assays uh, down the road. Um, so this year, uh, we are going to have uh, three uh, excellent speakers and um, uh, Dr. Stephanie Thomas, an assistant professor in uh, lab medicine and pathology at the University of Minnesota. She's going to be hosting the symposium and uh, moderating a panel discussion at the end uh, uh, of the three talks. So if uh, people have any questions um, uh, after each of the talks, I encourage them to put their questions into the Q&A box uh, on, the, uh, on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and then we will address all these questions as a part of the panel discussion uh, that Stephanie will be moderating after the end of the three talks. So with that, um, Stephanie, to you, you can take it over. Thanks. Great, uh, thank you very much, Bharat. Um, so I am very honored to introduce our first keynote speaker for today's symposium, uh, Dr. Michael Snyder. Um, Dr. Snyder, um, I will ask for your forgiveness in abbreviating your <laughs> extensive list of very remarkable accomplishments, uh, but here we go. So uh, Dr. Snyder is the Stanford Asherman Professor and Chair of Genetics and the Director of the Center of Genomics and Personalized Medicine. Uh, Dr. Snyder received his PhD training at Caltech and carried out postdoc training at Stanford. Um, his first faculty position was at Yale where he rose through the academic ranks from an assistant to a full professor with tenure. Uh, Dr. Snyder is a leader in the field of functional genomics and multiomics and one of the major participants of the ENCODE project. Um, his lab was the first to perform a large-scale functional genomics project in any organism, and his lab has also developed many technologies in genomics and proteomics. Uh, these include the development of proteome chips, high-resolution tiling arrays for the entire human genome, methods for global mapping of transcription factor binding sites, paired-in sequencing for mapping of structural variation in eukaryotes, de novo genome sequencing using high-throughput technologies, and RNA-seq. Dr. Snyder launched the field of personalized medicine by combining different state-of-the-art um, omics technologies to perform the first longitudinal detailed integrated personal omics profile or IPOP of a person. And his lab also pioneered the use of wearable technologies, uh, smart watches and continuous glucose monitoring for precision health. Um, he's a co-founder of many biotech companies, including Personalis, Sensomics, QBio, January Protos, Oralome, Miravi, and Filtracine. Uh, Dr. Snyder has more than 600 publications and more than 150,000 citations, including 20 publications with more than 1,000 citations, and his H index is 177. Um, he has mentored more than 70 PhD students, 180 postdoc fellows, 120 undergrads, and 60 high school students. Um, he has four R01s in addition to several other NIH-funded projects associated with UM1, U24, R25, UTC, um, U U2C, and U54 funding mechanisms. So we are very fortunate to have Dr. Snyder kick off today's symposium. Um, Dr. Snyder, the Zoom podium is yours. All right, well, thanks very much. That's me by the numbers. I guess it can be summarized two ways. One is I'm conflicted about everything I'm gonna tell you today. Uh, and the other is, um, I forgot, but it, something about numbers. Anyway, here we go. So I am gonna tell you about our work using big data and health, and it's gonna go beyond mass spectrometry, although mass spectrometry is clearly an important part of this. I think it's one segment of a, of a myriad of data that I think will ultimately be used to better manage healthcare. And what I'll present to you is obviously a research project, although we have spun it off as a number of companies that I think is a way to scale what we're trying to do to a broader population. So um, that's my quick introduction, and of course, I can't resist sneaking in some work on COVID here. So I always like to start with um, this slide, which I think only partly illustrates the problem with medicine as it's practiced today, um, 
which is it tends to be very conservative uh, by nature. You probably know that uh, the number one uh, um, user of, of fax machines in the world is actually the healthcare system. My daughters don't even know what a fax machine is actually anymore. So uh, uh, other sorts of problems are listed here, which is that we're very focused, uh, medicine is very focused on illness, tends to be very reactive. Uh, consequently, we, it, well, when you're healthy, sorry, we measure very few things. Uh, and also when you're healthy, you don't get measured very often. But the biggest problem is the one down here. Nearly every decision about your health is based on population-based me measurements. Instead, I think we would all agree it's better to be focused on keeping people healthy, be very proactive. We're certainly capable of measuring many more things than we currently do. And the frequency, I would argue, depends on both what your risk is and what your personal trajectories are looking like for various biomarkers. And perhaps again, most importantly, I think we should be focused on individual-based medicine rather than population-based. Uh, and many people say we do that, but I would argue not at the scale we should. And by the way, then we should be focused on precision health rather than precision medicine. So uh, just to illustrate this point, this is something many of you may know, but most people don't. You're told that the average oral temperature is 90.6, but actually if you look at various studies out there where people have had their oral temperature me measured and, and they're healthy, the median number is more like 97.5, but the bigger issue is that there's a spread. Uh, this is the 25th quartile at 94.6. This is the 75th quartile at 99.1. And so in today's world, if your normal baseline temperature is 94.6 and you go to a physician's office and they measure you at 98.6, they'll tell you're healthy, everything's fine, you're, you're perfectly normal, but you're up four degrees Fahrenheit, I guarantee you're not normal, you're probably quite ill. And so that's a theme I'll hammer several times, it's really, really important to know what your baseline is. Now your health is influenced by many things. Your, your genome is an obvious one, but there are many other aspects as well. Various things you're exposed to, so pathogens obviously relevant right now, environmental exposures, stress, food, exercise, the so lifestyle, all influence your health. We're in a world where it's now possible to quantify um, pretty near all these things, some well, like exercise and activity, you can get reasonably well. Food is still clunky. This part is something we're working on a lot. Uh, but one can make measurements on these. And equally importantly, you can measure their effects. You can measure their effects on your molecular composition by doing various advanced um, technologies, such as mass spectrometry, the focus of this symposium. But also we would argue genome sequencing wearables, these can all be measured now pretty readily so you can define your health state. And so a number of years ago, uh, it's actually a little over eight years now, we set up something we call personal omics profile filing, where in addition to your genome, we make measurements on many other ohms. So your epigenome, meaning your DNA methylome, uh, transcriptome, these are all measured out of the peripheral blood monocyte cells, so your immune cells. Uh, proteome and cytokines, we measure um, out of plasma typically, but we'll also measure proteome out of PBMCs. Um, metabolome, lipid, uh, um, also out of plasma, and we'll measure microbiome out of gut, and nasal. So in its most deluxe form, we'll, we'll make eight different omics measurements, if you will, uh, sorry, it, 14 different ones. And in the, in the routine one, it's about eight different ohms we use. Um, and so we also do deep clinical testing, some advanced tests at about eight years ago as well, maybe seven and a half we added on wearables and biosensors. And so uh, one aspect is the fact that we are making deep data measurements. And the other aspect is we follow people over time longitudinally. So we're sampling this group of people, which is smallish, uh, it's 109 folks. Uh, we basically sample them roughly every three months when they're healthy. And then when an adverse event like the viral infection or something like that comes along, we usually take five to seven additional samplings. But so you might say, why are we doing all this? Well, what we're trying to do is understand what it means to be healthy. How does that change over time? How do healthy pe pe states, if you will, differ between different people? And then most importantly, what happens at early times of illnesses? And equally importantly, I would argue, we wanna see whether these advanced technologies can be better used to manage people's health. 
And so uh, just from the first little over three years of study, just getting at the last point, it turns out these technologies are really quite powerful. We had 49 major health discoveries, 67 if you count hypertension, and most of these were found pre-symptomatically uh, using these advanced tests. And just to give you a few examples, I'll show you pictures in a minute, but we caught some of the early lymphoma, uh, two cases of precancer, and gus smoldering myeloma, two serious heart issues, so on and so forth. And, and what was important about this was that no one technology found all these things. It was different technologies revealed different things. And the combination was especially powerful. So for example, genome sequencing found this heart case. I'll show you that in a minute, several other cases. Uh, and sometimes imaging, sometimes it was wearables. So the combination as a whole was very, very powerful. And again, sometimes there's multiple measurements that, that made this happen. So now the genome sequencing was quite important. Just from the first 70 people, we had 13 major health discoveries. 12 people had what we call Mendelian pathogenic mutations, uh, and, you know, a typical example being BRCA1. This individual had, one individual had a BRCA1 mutation. Uh, these, these in red are what are called the American College, American Medi College of Medical Genetics genes. Uh, we had six individuals with mutations there. We went a lot deeper and found six others. Uh, three of these things turned out to be pretty important. Uh, one individual had a mutation in this gene, which turns out this, uh, 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 it's a cardiomyopathy gene. And it turns out, a fairly young guy, it turns out he has a heart defect. And his father actually died of a heart attack in the 60s and 50s. And so we think this is the culprit. Uh, and from a stress cycle, he does have a heart defect. He's on medication now. Uh, this individual, also fairly young, uh, one of these represents two, had a mutation. This gene puts him at risk for certain cancers, did a whole body MRI follow-up, and sure enough, actually had early thyroid cancer, which was removed and is basically good shape, doesn't need thyroid replacement uh, therapy. You'll see in a minute, um, nine individuals came into the study uh, thinking they were type two diabetic. One individual actually, who was uh, one of those nine, actually is really uh, an HFL, HF, uh, HNF1 alpha mutation, a MODI mutation, which is quite a bit different and actually switched your medication as a consequence. So the bottom line is that, that um, we think the information from genome sequencing was quite important. The 13th was actually a pretty important pharmacogenetic mutation. Uh, this is the example of the early lymphoma. This came from multivariate, meaning we saw an enlarged spleen, but also saw elevated blood markers. Again, pre-symptomatic and, and that caught it and person's treated and I think is doing very, very well. Uh, Here's an individual who had uh, given two samples. There's a thousand samples here. Uh, here's the other 108. And basically this individual had uh, too much IgM, way more than everyone else. Uh, and then follow-up said that actually they had too many IgM producing cells and actually had this condition called MGUS, which can convert to aggressive cancer. Here's another case of smoldering myeloma. So the bottom line is that, again, we could find a lot of these things uh, by these different molecular measurements, um, six people with plaques in their arteries and one of the six, in all cases, uh, not huge amounts, uh, but um, the recommendation is increase your statins. That was done for me and mine seems to be shrinking. Now we have a strong interest in type two diabetes because I'm actually type two diabetic. It was predicted from my genome sequence, in fact. Um, and coming into the study, as they say, nine individuals thought they were diabetic and, and two others turned out to be diabetic. They didn't know it. And of course, many others turned out to be pre-diabetic and didn't know it. And, and I'll come to this a little more later, but nine out of 10 pre-diabetics have no idea they're pre-diabetic. And 70% of those are going to turn to di uh, become diabetic in their lifetime. So we think that's pretty important to know. Now, we are very interested in how do people become type 2 diabetic. And so during the first four years of the study, nine of the nine additional individuals became type 2 diabetic uh, classified clinically and others had diabetic range values. And so we we're kind of curious, well, how do people become type 2 diabetic? Do they just gradually get there? Do they spike their way there? What, what's going on? Well, of the nine, two of them actually had uh, they gained weight, sort of typical, their microbiome diversity dropped, and they became type 2 diabetic. Of the remaining seven, five of them gradually became diabetic. So 
uh, that's shown over here, orange is uh, fasting glucose and, and gray line is hemoglobin A1C. And so this individual got there through fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C. This one through an oral glucose tolerance test. They measure slightly different things. And so uh, we think that's mechanistically relevant. Um, uh, two people actually spiked their way there. And I'm one of the two. I, my, my genome said I was genetically predisposed from something called a polygenic risk score. Uh, but uh, I actually first uh, discovered uh, diabetes because I was getting actually measured for my because my genome, uh, I did an insulin resistance test and my, my values were actually elevated. And it turns out it was popped up right after a, a nasty viral infection. Now, some of you may have heard me talk about this before, but um, so it was literally after the viral infections when my glucose shot through the roof. I know this looks like a tiny spike, but it's actually about a year. I, I changed my lifestyle. I got, I got classified as type two diabetic at that time. Um, and I changed my lifestyle. I started running, <clears throat> doubled my biking and, and totally cut out sugars and got it to normal. It was boringly low. And, and then someone else looked at it here <laughs> when it was very high again, actually it's over seven for my hemoglobin A1C and flagged it and said, oh, I had no idea. So I sampled a few more times. Uh, I'd stopped running and guess when that was? Right there. But I also had a secondary viral infection. So it could be a combination of both. I did start running. I got it partly under control, but I never got it all the way down the baseline again. And it gradually kept creeping up and actually switching this next slide, you can see this in a little more detail. Uh, so it kept creeping up. And, and so the, uh, what happened was finally, uh, well, first of all, I switched from running to lifting weights because I had heard that muscle mass better for glucose homeostasis, that failed. Then I went on metformin, which is the frontline drug, I'm sure you know, for type two diabetes. Uh, turns out I'm a non-responder, which is not common. So that failed as well. And then finally, as this thing kept creeping up, so this is when I was lifting weights, I'm still lifting weights for other reasons, but uh, it kept creeping up, got to 7.5. And then finally, what did I do? I got more data and it became very clear to me that I was insulin sensitive and I also made insulin just fine. So what's wrong? Well, I, I don't release insulin from the pancreas properly. So I took rapinolide and that actually works pretty well. So that drove my glucose down quite well. And so the point out of all this is that we think it's pretty important to know uh, mechanistically, if you can, what's going on and then design the right therapy for the right person. And we call this precision diabetes. Uh, um, and what I described is actually quite doable with simple tests, could have figured this out a lot earlier had we done the right tests early, but at least we did figure it out. So again, the point is that I think getting the right data can be very, very valuable. And overall, these advanced technologies were quite powerful for managing uh, not only health of the entire group, or at least half the group, but also for me personally. Now, one of the things we learned as we were profiling people, uh, we were taking these measurements after fasting, I should say. And one of the things we discovered is that no matter how we measured people, whether it's metabolome or proteome or transcriptome, here are cytokines in clinical labs. Uh, if you look at people's healthy baselines, they're actually pretty stable and they don't change that much. It's just looking at 12 people with 10 or more visits and each color is a different person, each dot is a different visit. So basically I'm the light blue, this is six years of data, my dots all cluster together, same with the brown, same with the yellow, so on and so forth. So the point is that we all have personal baselines and they're pretty stable and, and uh, that, that could actually um, do distinguish ourselves. They're quite robust. Not only that, if you undergo a perturbation such as a viral infection, we're shown here, we had people run to their VO2 max and then profiled them right after that. Half their molecules change in abundance. But if you look at their profiles, they still look more like themselves than other people. And the same is true for a viral infection. You will shift your profile but you still mostly look like you rather than others. And so again, these profiles are pretty robust and what this has important implications. One is it means that when you're trying to measure people and detect uh, you know, perturbations like viral infections or other disease states, there's no better reference than yourself because it's very easy to see that shift. But if you're trying to tell the difference between the disease you by comparing that to a 
you know, 100 or 1,000 other healthy people, that's very, very hard because we're also different individually. So that's the point that it's very hard to actually uh, get the, the um, tell health states from population-based uh, measurements, it's much easier to do it to your own reference. And so again, we would argue it's very, very important to get a healthy baseline. That, that's a concept that's hard for most people to understand. They think, oh, you need thousands of people to understand what's going on for your own health. Actually, you only need a healthy measurement and a sick one, all the more it is better. Okay, so I told you that most of these you know, molecular uh, measurements are pretty stable over time, even over years. But there are two patterns we've noticed that change. We specifically went looking for these. We, one is we decided to see if there were seasonal patterns in the data. And we, we were kind of intrigued by this concept, you know, how many seasons are there? The, the cohort we have, they're, they're based in Northern California, three of them from Southern California. And you've been told since you were little that there are, you know, four biological seasons and they're three months each. And if you think about it, it's, you know, who says that maybe there's 15 biological seasons, maybe there's two, and maybe they're really, you know, some are three weeks and others are five months, who knows? Uh, so we let the data tell us what's going on rather than try and make up calendars, which is an artificial person-made construct. And so what we did was we went into our molecules. Our samples, it turns out, were pretty evenly distributed throughout the year. Uh, we had over 1,000 samples from these 109 people. And it turns out there's roughly 1,150 seasonal molecules or microbes, so counting the microbiome. So there's a little over 1,000 molecules that show seasonal patterns. And a lot of them were known already. Here's hemoglobin A1C, red blood cells, and so on. But a lot were brand new and hadn't been identified including most of the microbiome uh, changes that we saw. So we said, all right, we have all these seasonal molecules and microbes, how many patterns do they fall into? And it turns out we can show mathematically there's two major patterns that are there. There are more than two, but two major patterns that these molecules and microbes fall into. And one, of, you'd say, well, it's California, of course, two patterns, one's probably winter, one's probably summer, and you'd be half right. So this is actually, one is winter. So these are molecules and microbes that peak, you know, around December, spilling into January, so end of the year. And it turns out those are things involved in acute phase signaling, things like, uh, um, uh, you know, your viral infection response, uh, things of that, even acne, it turns out, and this is known already, peaks in winter. But the other one actually turns out to be late April, May, and this, in hindsight, makes sense. A lot of the molecules are involved in allergies and asthma responses. So that, that does make sense. Although we did see quite a bit involved in cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, and type 2 diabetes peaking around then. So our interpretation of this is that um, even in California, people are less active in winter than they are in, 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 in summer. And so what happens is that, you know, it does rain here. It gets cold at night, believe it or not, cold for us can be you know, high 50s or low 60s. Uh, and so if people are less active and we think what's happening is some of these molecules are gradually built, building up and then go away. And there are other uh, things, by the way, that don't make as much sense to us, seizures and sleep peaking around this time isn't quite as clear to us, but, but and there's some other in there too. So, but anyway, we, we would argue there's a second pattern. So we think this is relevant clinically because there's a lot of clinical markers associated with these patterns. Uh, and one could argue that it's kind of important to see what's going on in people. If people are dipping too low, you might want to encourage them, for example, these cardiovascular markers and things to actually, you know, maybe try and get a little more exercise in winter. And the other argument you could say is, well, maybe as people, as spring is coming, you know, we won't worry about it so much because they will probably become more active and, and it'll go down. But Either way, you can take these into account. Uh, we even see, as they say, microbes that um, um, change during this time. So you see a lot of microbes in your, in, in your nose changing in the seasonal pattern, and also some in your gut, and it's probably likely due to the food that you eat. The other time we see changes is, is during aging, so over time, uh, which we're interpreting as aging. So, what was special about this is that we're actually following the exact same people over time. This is different from most aging studies, which look at old people and young people and say, here are the molecular differences. So we found 600 molecules that are changing over time. 
And we looked at them at the individual level. What we discovered is that everybody's aging differently. So this is me, for us to say, but I am one, well, I guess it's obvious, one of the uh, um, people have been profiling me for now a little over 11 years. Uh, and basically my coagulation pathway, metabolic pathways all go up. There's about four years of data. Uh, here's another person. They're basically their top pathway changing is their cardiac hypertrophy signaling pathway. So we think they're a cardio age or their top pathway. And um, it turns out we later learned they're stage two hypertensive. So we think you only need as many as five measurements within two years, and you can see how people are aging. And uh, we think that's powerful because it's potentially actionable. You, the reality is if you take most of that stuff in CVS, you'd have no way of knowing it's working because you don't have good markers. And we think by following people this way, we could get this. So we looked at the various uh, ways people are aging. We had 43 people that we can measure their aging on. And we said, well, do they fall into patterns just like the seasonal patterns? And the answer is that yes, there, we found four major patterns. Now I know there are more than four. We call them age types. Uh, for example, there's only one instance of the cardio ager, so that wasn't statistically significant for calling a pattern, but we had four others that, that are, there's enough you know, people doing this uh, that we can see this as a major pattern. So they're what we call kidney agers, liver agers, metabolic. Some of these are somewhat overlapping and immuno agers. So again, people are aging differently. These molecules are changing over time and each column is a different person. Each row is one of these age types. So people down here are aging in all four categories. This one's aging in three of the four. I'm somewhere in here. I'm, I'm not much of an immuno ager. I might be that one, but I age more in the other categories. This person's a kidney ager, kidney and metabolic, and so on. So again, we can see how people are aging. And uh, we actually think of this then like a car. Your whole car, you know, your car gets older, but some parts start wearing out first. And, and so we think it's useful to see this. And within these age types, there are clinical markers. Again, I'm showing this more morally for illustrative purposes. The pattern as a whole, we think is more powerful than individual markers, but this is easy for people to understand. So this is looking at hemoglobin A1C, this marker of diabetes. The population as a whole goes up. That's what's shown over here. And if you look at individuals, the dark bars are statistically significant. We do have four people going up. But interestingly, we had four others going down. And if we look at what's going on for these four, well, uh, two of them underwent di a diet, one started exercising, two people lost weight and so on. So we actually have an explanation for what's going on here and that's kind of nice to see. Over, over here, with this creatinine, a measure of kidney function, the population as a whole is going up, but 10 individuals were going down. And if we look at what's going on there, uh, we don't fully understand this, but eight of the 10 are actually on statins and it could be muscle mass, I suppose, but um, we didn't notice any changes in that from weight loss and other measurements, but uh, I suppose it's possible. But anyway, the statins were associated with improved creatinine levels and, and possibly kidney function and so on. So, so again, we think this is potentially actionable information. But the other thing we did do, we tried to validate our work a bit by using known uh, uh, aging uh, markers. Uh, Morgan Levine has set up something that she calls PhenoAge. Uh, it's a measure of nine markers that typically go up. And, and sure enough, we can see our folks uh, are um, either showing, this is their biological age, this is their chronological age. And so some people are aging faster than their chronological age and others are slower, which is kind of what you want to be at. Uh, I happen to be spot on, that was disappointing, but it is what it is. Um, so anyway, the point is that we do have people aging at different rates and some of them, you know, have pretty sharp slopes, so that's not so good. Others have lower slopes. I doubt that anyone's reversing their age just yet. Uh, I think this is just, the statistics don't have that perfectly worked out, but um, okay. So, so anyway, we think we can tell how people are aging from all this uh, and in an actionable time frame. So that's kind of cool. Uh, the one question I get a lot is, Mike, how are you going to scale this? This is really expensive, which is true, uh, but it was a proof of principle. And so uh, we, we did set up a company around this. It's called QBio. They do a very medical version of what I showed you. So uh, the information is much more actionable. 
and they display it back in a very useful fashion. They also added on whole body MRI. And just from the first 100 plus people, they found a lot of really important stuff. So examples include prostate cancer, ovarian, and so on. And even early pancreatic cancer was found. But what was important is just like IPOP, some of this was found, most of it was found because we had multiple measurements saying something was off. These are all pre-symptomatic, by the way. And in other cases, the longitudinal measurements were really, really powerful for finding this. So again, we think that big data longitudinally can be very, very powerful. And we hope that this will be the way to go. So the other area we've done a lot in, let's see how we're doing time-wise, oh, we're in good shape, uh, is wearables. So we're very keen on trying to use wearables to better measure people's health. We got involved in this uh, about seven and a half years ago before the Apple Watch was out. Uh, when people were mostly using these as fitness trackers, they'd figure out their steps and throw them in a drawer uh, and after about three months. So people, because once you figure out your pattern, you know, you think you got it. But we recognize these are pretty powerful health monitors. They make hundreds of thousands of measurements a day. Some of them will take as many as 2.5 million measurements. They're also widely used, 20%, 50 million people of the U.S. population use a smartwatch, which is pretty amazing. And they can measure many, many different things. They'll measure heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration, blood, so on and so forth. And so uh, we basically set out to use these and see you know, how powerful they could be for health monitoring. I should point out that I'm wearing, if you look up, I'm wearing four of these devices of four smartwatches. I normally have a ring, I lost it, and so on and so forth. In fact, I use eight devices every day. Here's my exposometer. So the way you use these is for each person, you figure out their, their circadian pattern, their, their basic patterns. And so here's my sleep, heart rate, skin temperature. So I sleep at night, wake during the day, occasional nap, back to sleep, heart rates, low at night, high during day, back down, skin temperature, which is different from oral temperature. It's high at night, drops in the day. For most people, it comes back up. And so what we discovered as we were using these is that we, they, you know, they could find amusing things. Uh, one thing that's known already, not well known, but most people, uh, uh, well, every, yeah, nearly everybody drops their blood oxygen on airline flights and their heart rate goes up. Uh, but we discovered you can pick up infectious disease with these devices. Um, and so actually the way we got into this, I figured out my Lyme disease from a simple, when I first got it, from a simple smartwatch and a pulse ox. And the story was I was helping my brother put up fences in rural Massachusetts where most ticks are Lyme infested. And then two weeks later was flying to Norway through Frankfurt. And on this last flight from uh, um, yeah, Frankfurt to, to Oslo, my blood oxygen was abnormally low. It's normally here on that kind of plane, it dropped to here uh, and it never came back to normal. I noticed my heart rate was up. There's a low resolution way of showing this. Uh, I later learned my skin temperature was elevated too. Uh, about a day later, I did get a low grade fever. I went to a physician in Norway. I warned him it might be Lyme because of the timing. He drew blood, said my yep, monocytes are up. I had a bacterial infection. He was recommending penicillin. I said, no, I need doxycycline. A little tense there for a few months. Uh, he did give in uh, and then basically, um, I took the doxycycline, cleared it right up. Uh, when I got back, I got measured. Sure enough, I was Lyme positive by Sierra tests, even had a few antigens around. You do take doxycycline the whole time. Uh, I'd given blood before I left. We tested that too. I was negative. So I sera converted during this time. So the bottom line out of this is I could pick up my Lyme disease from a simple smartwatch and a pulse ox. So then we looked at all the data I had at the time, and there were four times I was ill the Lyme time, two times of viral disease, one here, one here, and a, and a fourth time I didn't report being ill. So I was asymptomatic, but I was ill because I had high CRP, same height as these others, very high. Uh, so every single, and it turns out every single time I was ill, I had a high resting heart rate and high skin temperature. So we wrote an algorithm called change of heart, basically that follows your baseline and looks at the delta plot, looks for the shift up in resting heart rate. And it works for every time retrospectively, we could show uh, my illness prior to symptoms, which is the red line. And it not only worked on me, it worked on three other people, one of whom got sick twice. So we had this algorithm that could see your shifting heart rate 
in advance of, of symptoms uh, from a respiratory illness. So as you might imagine, when the pandemic came, we really scaled this up. Uh, we had been improving our algorithms, we building an infrastructure. And then uh, basically, as, when the pandemic came, as I say, we, we got IRB approval to launch us, went higher. And, and you might say, well, how important is this now? Well, we're still running, it's a little dated here, I should update this, but we're still running 60,000 cases a day. It's not gone away. In fact, it's pretty near as high as it was in the second surge and people are still dying. So we think this is still a powerful approach. And if you think about what people are doing now, they use a thermometer. And, and you know, I'm sure this is true in Minnesota when, when if you walk up to a restaurant or an institution, whatever here, and they shine this thermometer on you, it's always cold because it's cold outside. I've never seen an accurate reading from this thermometer myself. So I don't know if you guys have better cold resistant thermometers somehow, but um, I don't know, I think it's almost worthless. Uh, and so people are counting on PCR, but it takes a day to get back your results. You don't get measured all the time because it's pretty expensive and inconvenient. So we think this has the potential to actually be useful for early diagnostics of, of respiratory illnesses. And so, uh, as I say, when the pandemic hit, we, we rebooted our, we had to adjust their study, partnered with leading companies, Fitbit Carmen, and very quickly got 5,300 people enrolled. Uh, 32 of them, we started with Fitbit uh, because we could get the data we wanted most there. 32 people right away that enrolled had a COVID-19 illness and they were wearing a smartwatch at the time. Not only that, they had a diagnosis date and a symptom date. We had other people as well, but they didn't always have the relevant dates. So we took these 32 people, we called them with their golden data sets and started analyzing them. And here is the very first one. Here's an individual, uh, this, is their, their, this is resting heart rate up here. Here's their diagnosis date in purple, and here's their symptom date in red. And if you look at it, you, this is a resting heart rate. You can't miss that nine and a half days prior to symptom onset, they had a jump up in resting heart rate, which we assume is when they got ill. And we've written an alarming system I'll tell you about in a minute that helps pick this up. So um, the bottom line is this person was, you know, got ill and was presumably spreading this for nine and a half days without knowing it. So when we looked at all 32, for 26 of 32, we could pick up this increase in resting heart rate from their baseline. Uh, and we've written several algorithms, works in all those algorithms, uh, different sensitivities. Uh, and, and we do, it's not perfect. We do miss it in six. And we have a hard time getting a stable baseline for those six. And we think that's why three of them have severe asthma. And that's been tricky. Uh, if we look at the summation, it turns out that on average, we're picking up illness, uh, this jump up in resting heart rate, a median of four days prior to symptom onset. So four days before symptoms occur, we can see this jump up sometimes longer, sometimes less. Uh, um, yeah, those are the ones you miss then obviously. And it's seven days before diagnosis. I do wanna emphasize it's not specific for COVID. Other respiratory illnesses will trigger this. In this case, the median time is two days and that makes sense because COVID as a longer pre-symptomatic period. So we've written a, a real-time detection system where we measure your baseline on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, and we look for this jump up statistically. We can set the sensitivity to whatever you want. We pick the sensitivity that's roughly, makes the alarms go off roughly every two months on average, and gives still a pretty good warning. And so, um, Anyway, this is a COVID case, same thing. This alarm goes off nine days prior to symptoms. I think it's 10 days for diagnosis in this case. Here's another one, I believe that's seven or eight. Um, there are other bumps, uh, things like way too much drinking will do it, not just two drinks for dinner, but really tying one on. Uh, um, holiday, it turns out a lot of people have holiday bumps that can be due to drinking, stress we know triggers it, high altitude and travel can trigger it. So that might be what's doing here. These are real signals, don't get me wrong. These are jump ups and resting heart rate. Here is uh, um, another illness, non-COVID. And here's a healthy case. You know, again, maybe this is an asymptomatic situation. It's not really clear what's going on, uh, but it, there is some, it's a stressor event that's happening. 
So as you might imagine, and we've now rolled this out, I want all of you guys to join. Here's the link down at the bottom here. Uh, if you have a smartwatch, join our study. We have a real-time alerting system going right now. It's set up in a very simple fashion because that's what the IRB said was fine. Uh, we have three different algorithms. We set up an algorithm that's simpler, but it's scalable to tens of millions of people because we want to get it. That's basically what we want to get, millions of people joining our study. But what we've discovered is that just like before, we can see a jump up. We'll get a red alert popping up, probably easier to see here. You can get a red alert popping up prior to symptom onset. And in this case, diagnosis was the next day. So, so the, uh, how well does it work? Well, it works about 73% of the time, uh, both retrospective or pros prospectively. Uh, I doubt that that's significant, uh, but anyway, 70, so it's not perfect. And we have, we're gonna pull in more data types. I forgot to say it works on Fitbit, works on Apple Watch and so on and so forth. Uh, not only that, we've even picked up some asymptomatic cases. Here's a case where someone's diagnosed with COVID, yet their alarms went off, I think in this case, about 12 days prior to symptom, uh, uh, the PCR positive. There's another case with Apple Watch. Again, this one's shifted up early by a couple of weeks. So bottom line is we, we have a, a system that seems to work from a smartwatch, not perfect, but better than nothing for being able to tell uh, a, a shift up in resting heart rate, which can be associated with COVID. Uh, we published our first study on this in November as did the Scripps group, uh, and uh, but all in the Fitbit now, other groups of published using Aura Ring, Apple Watch, and so on, so we can, uh, most cases just show they're just showing they can detect. We actually still be, seem to be the only ones with the online detection system. Uh, I will say we think you can pull in other kinds of measurements from a smartwatch. Uh, they're really powerful medical trackers, if you will. Uh, we can pick up hemocrit, uh, some signal for hemocrit, red blood cell count, um, hemoglobin A1C. This is from some modeling we've done. Even, even some level of A1C signal can be found there. These aren't clinically you know, valid tests. What they are is they're pointers. If you see a shift up here, it's a pointer that something uh, might be up. So we'll have a paper coming out on that any day. Lastly, uh, because it's late, I might just go over this quickly, but we have a lot going on with continuous glucose monitoring. We put these on normal people, pre-diabetics, and even a few diabetics. But what we've discovered is that a lot of people, uh, they, they do have decent glucose control, but a lot of people are moderate spikers or even severe spikers after they eat something, which, which and many of them didn't know it. And so we've written algorithms to be able to, you know, classify these patterns and develop what we call glucotypes. Uh, so we classify people. These are mostly for healthy people, whether they have low glucose values, medium or high. So these are, we classify people into these different glucotypes. And one of the other things we've discovered is that different people spike to different foods. So some people spike to bread and peanut butter, others protein bars, others to pasta, some to grapes, some to other kinds of berries. Uh, nearly everybody spikes to cornflakes and milk. We think that's like poison for you, probably worse than smoking. Uh, so some foods just aren't very, very good. Possibly it should even be outlawed. I think one of the cool things we discover is there's a lot of what are thought to be healthy people by all the standard clinical measurements, but they're pretty severe spikers, spiking just as bad as diabetics. So one of the important things we built is a health dashboard. We can pull all the health information into your smartphone and actually display it to you in real time. And so we think your smartphone is gonna be your most important medical device in the future. Forgot to check my alarm, I'm doing it now. Um, so to see, and anyway, you can pull in this different data, not only wearable data, but microomics data, clinical data, and display it whatever level you like, daily, weekly, monthly, what have you. And so we think that this is gonna be very, very powerful for tracking your health. This is my health. I could actually pick up two times when I had adverse events. This is almost cheating. One was a, a viral infection, and the other was actually when I fell off my bike and wound up in a hospital. So uh, mind you, I didn't need a smartwatch for following that. But the point is that we think we can use the same schema, if you will, the same approach to try and find more subtle, more chronic conditions that might otherwise be missed. And so again, we think this is gonna be powerful following this information, 
sharing it with your physician so you can get a better picture of your health state. And so this is what I envision as Mike Snyder's world, a world where people are getting their genome sequenced before they're born, uh, together with some deep molecular profiling, uh, as well as wearable data, will better manage people's risk, uh, predict risk, uh, catch disease early, monitor and treat disease, and overall better manage their health. So I've been very fortunate. I have an amazing lab of uh, people. A uh, number of folks are listed here. When you shall, Rui Chen and George Mia started. When you shall, Brian Piney, Kevin Contrapa. Uh, George Weinstock has been a fantastic microbiome collaborator. Tracy McLaughlin on the clinical side. And then these are some of the folks that did the wearable data. I didn't get them to expose them. So we've now got a very, very large wearable team to be able to try and make an impact. We're trying to roll this out during the pandemic and, and ideally help people and alarm them uh, when they have a serious illness. So that's what I'm up to. I think I saved some time for questions. I hope I didn't go too fast, but I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. Hey, great. Yeah, thank you so much for that very dynamic presentation. Um, we're actually going to save the Q&A um, until the wow. panel discussion, at the end, but we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So um, if I may, I may ask just a, a personal question from my perspective. So I know that you're um, combining a lot of different omics data, and you did mention proteomics. And can you just um, elaborate a little bit on the analytical platform that you're using to, um, to acquire that proteomic data? Yeah, so we were doing for this study TMT labeling and, and using you know the ORI traps uh, that we had at the time. We're now setting up as as our other groups more standardized targeted assays, MRM type assays, where we'll follow a, a panel of. We're right now we're setting up for two to three hundred different you know biologically relevant markers that we can get absolute quantification on. Uh, by spiking standards. So, so it'll be a more, again, standardized test. So it's a classic case of moving from, um, you know, a discovery platform to try and move into a more targeted, but still high content platform. So again, we could get a better picture of people's health. So thanks for the question. The same is true for the metabolomics, by the way, and the lipidomics. The, the metabolomics is uh, untargeted, but the lipidomics is semi-targeted with this platform called Lipidizer for those of you who follow this sort of thing. Yeah, so, well, I would have uh, um, added more data, if, uh, but I probably overloaded you anyway, if I <laughs> realized that, so all good. Great, great, yeah, thank you so much again. And then to all of our participants, a reminder to please um, put your questions in the Q&A and we will circle back to those questions at the uh, end for our panel discussion, which will take place from one o'clock until 1.30 uh, p.m. And actually, uh, I, sorry, I'll make one exception here for, <laughs> we have a question here from, our, uh, from one of our other speakers, uh, Dr. Omen. Um, so he wants to know, is Stanford Health or the UC system deploying your individual monitoring services on a population scale? Um, he said that he is involved in the ISB-based studies via arrival and now Providence St. Joseph Healthcare System. Yeah, so the, the answer is Stanford is not. We spun it off as private and are rolling it out in that fashion. Um, it's, you know, a different business model than Aryville, I guess, in the sense that it, we are going private, people do pay. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a problem in the sense that uh, uh, it's interesting that Providence is doing this. You know, finding people who will pay for this is the problem for I think our healthcare system's broken, quite frankly. People don't pay to keep you healthy. They pay when you're ill. So it is interesting that Providence is rolling that out. Uh, so right now it's a pay out of pocket system with QBio, but we've set it up in a way, I, I think what we've done that strategically should be a bit better than Aryvale's, the information we get back is medically valuable. So physicians are pretty excited. In fact, our folks take it to their physicians. And the platform they display it in is really very user-friendly. I mean, that's a big flaw with the current medical system. I'm sure if any of you have used Epic, it's probably one of the most cumbersome systems. It's hard to extract data. We present data in an incredibly organized fashion that actually, again, physicians all say, wow, I wish we had this here at Stanford. <laughs> so right now it's all private, but it would be nice to scale it and we uh, to academic and, and get it reimbursed. And so we have schemes for doing that. We also have some interesting novel technologies that we're building at QBio as well, so. 
Great, great. Thanks. And then sorry, making another exception. Okay, so this will be the last question before we move on to our next speaker, Scott Walmsley. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of following along the same um, line of questioning. So um, this question gets, this is from um, Ellen, and she, this is along the lines of this, the whole like financial aspect of this, the personal omics profiling. So um, she said, first of all, great talk. And she says, in the long, long run, um, how do you see, I guess, the like personal omics profiling uh, being implemented. And she says, it seems currently restricted to people that can afford it. So I guess what are yeah. your thoughts on like the, the financial aspect? Yeah, great question. Well, the wearable stuff I think can get out to everyone now. So our mission, to be honest, there, there are 4 billion people with access to smartphone. And so, so 60% of the planet. So I would like to pair that with a smartwatch on every single one of them. And you would have some level of health monitoring and it's dirt cheap. You don't need an expensive smartwatch to do what I just presented today. So I think that aspect could get out very broadly, very quickly. And I know a lot of the you know, smartwatch manufacturers are very interested in this. And so they're jumping and we're open sourcing all of our software and our platform for that matter. Uh, so that part's quick. The other part, I agree, it's very expensive. And we just have to show value. And then I think in, in some areas that'll be easier than others. We think cardiovascular disease would be an easier area to show it pays to profile people to keep them healthy and save a lot of money. Otherwise, there's a lot of resistance from insurance. I, I think it's plausible that we'll get employers, large employers to pay for this, that pays them to keep their employees healthy. Uh, so they have more productive lives. So, so I think we need new business models all the way around to be able to implement this the way I'd like to see it. And of course, because it is out of pocket right now, the, the rich can get it and the poor can't. But I think as we show value, hopefully everybody can get it. That will be the goal. All right, great. Yes, and on that optimistic note, we will go ahead and switch over to our next speaker. So thank you very much again, Dr. Snyder, and we will circle back with you um, in about an hour and a half for the panel discussion. All right, so we are moving on to our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Scott Walmsley. So um, Dr. Walmsley describes himself as a former molecular biologist turned informaticist and computer programmer. He performs informatic artistry in the world of molecular data analysis, combining his right brain creative influx with his left brain discipline. Dr. Walmsley is a, com a computational scientist in the Institute of Health Informatics, and he is the bioinformatics coordinator for the Masonic Cancer Center Analytical Biochemistry Shared Resource here at the University of Minnesota. He earned his PhD from Colorado State University and completed postdoc training at the University of Michigan Medical School in the lab of Dr. Alexei Nesvishki. Dr. Walmsley's research and development interests are in informatics, algorithm, um, algorithm development, and bench science for the fields of proteomics, metabolomics, and DNA adictomics, particularly in the area of applied mass spectrometry. Uh, Dr. Walmsley is a co-investigator on three R01s and an R03, and among his um, honors and awards are two travel awards from the United States uh, Human Proteome Organization, or US HUPO. And here is a fun fact. So our previous speaker, Dr. Snyder, and our final speaker, Dr. Ullman, are both past presidents of US HUPO. Um, all right, so Dr. Walmsley, we're looking forward to your presentation, and the Zoom podium is now yours. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to put up my presentation now. Can everyone see this? Okay. Yes, we can. Yep. Excellent. So uh, the bulk of my work is uh, involved in an area called DNA adectomics. Um, basically, I would describe that as an intersection between metabolomics and genomics, uh, because we are looking for uh, molecules that modify DNA. Um, briefly, uh, for this talk, um, I'll give you a, a little bit of a background of what DNA adectomics are and how we detect them. Uh, somewhat of an introduction to how we perform software development uh, for a particular problem in detecting modified DNA uh, using mass spectrometry and some of the uh, uh, test cases that we came up with in order to prove uh, uh, the principle of how the software was truly detecting DNA addicts. Um, and then I also have a pretty exciting real world application where we've applied the usage of the software 
uh, related to aristolytic acid nephropathy. Um, uh, some pretty interesting uh, clinical relevance. And uh, I think uh, it, it sets a pretty interesting story when we relate the results to some genomic information. Uh, so what is the exposome and DNA adaptomics? Uh, the exposome uh, one can describe as the totality of environmental uh, compounds that could uh, enter the human body. Uh, we can um, uh, receive uh, carcinogens from uh, cooked meat, for example. We certainly get them from tobacco smoke. Uh, we can ingest them uh, from uh, dietary sources, either accidentally or purposefully. Uh, we can, they're born in uh, food packaging. Uh, we see them in pesticides, of course. Uh, there are other uh, factors that uh, certainly alter or have the uh, propensity to alter our genome. Uh, stress, air and water and pollution, it can be an external uh, modifier, but stress can be an internal modifier, for example, or an endogenous modifier. Uh, so diet, drugs, radiation, infection, and our lifestyles all affect uh, kind of our landscape of uh, 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 our, our DNA and, and how it's altered by external factors. Uh, so we're interested in how chemical carcinogens uh, interact with our DNA. Uh, and so in a very basic sense, uh, if we were to be exposed with a carcinogen or a xenobiotic, uh, it would enter our body through some means and then would uh, disperse through our tissues and enter our cells and through uh, metabolic uh, bioactivation methodologies within or uh, 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 pathways within the cell. Uh, we create reactive metabolites. These reactive metabolites um, can certainly uh, alter our DNA by mutating certain bases. Uh, and hopefully uh, our DNA repair mechanisms can reverse those. Uh, and so those, uh, uh, those mutations will not persist or those addicts will not persist, but sometimes those addicts persist and can lead to permanent mutations as we'll see in a later uh, demonstration. So we uh, use uh, what we call the methodology uh, allied mass spectrometry uh, technique called untargeted DNA uh, adactomics. Uh, untargeted meaning uh, we're not just interested in, in looking for one mutagen in our DNA, uh, we're interested in looking at the totality of all uh, mutagens uh, that have affected our DNA in certain disease models or certain exposures. Uh, so we seek to identify all DNA addicts found in a sample in DNA addict omics. Um, we can classify these DNA addicts as knowns versus unknowns. Uh, known DNA addicts, uh, there are approximately 340 or so in the literature today, uh, but I'll show you that there are potentially many, many more, uh, hundreds uh, possibly more than that, uh, that we can detect now using mass spectrometry. Um, so the unknowns are uh, very interesting because even though we can borrow from the allied uh, technology field of metabolomics and the tools developed for screening for metabolites, uh, we have uh, a little bit more difficulty in screening for unknowns and DNA addicts because uh, 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 most of our information and in databases, for example, of mutagens don't necessarily have information about mutagens uh, attached to a nucleobase. Uh, so our goal is a more uh, complete characterization of DNA damaging agents as well as profiling of individuals uh, in various uh, uh, clinical cohorts. Uh, specific challenges have included our math, uh, method of acquisition uh, using mass spectrometers. Uh, so there are things that had to be developed or new uh, scanning technologies that had to be reapplied and redeveloped for DNA adaptomics specifically. Um, the identification is a very difficult task unless you have known standards for known DNA addicts. Um, and we also often deal with uh, very low abundances. And I'll give you a, an example of that. So DNA addict looks something like this. Uh, a generalized DNA addict is we have our nucleobase, our A, G, C, or T. They have the ribose attached to it. Um, and then, of course, uh, the mutagen covalently modifying the nucleobase. 
Um, they're not all like this, um, but a uh, vast uh, majority of the addicts that we're looking at uh, follow this paradigm. The nice thing about this is uh, in a mass spectrometer, uh, as many of you know, we can use energy to selectively uh, fragment uh, these molecules into smaller constituents or smaller product ions. And if we uh, do that at a high enough energy, we can potentially uh, um, help identify what the molecule is. If we do that with a low enough energy, we can selectively fragment uh, this ribose uh, away from the DNA addict. And in about 90% or more of the known cases for DNA addicts, that's a uh, pretty de facto um, uh, methodology to uh, look at MS1 and MS2 data of VMS spectrometry. And, and uh, it would be a uh, de facto signature that we're uh, observing a DNA addict in our data. So DNA addict detection by LCMS, so our uh, gold standard tool is the high resolution uh, mass spectrometers, uh, more specifically the uh, Orbitrap mass spectrometers. Uh, we start with our tissue or a sample of some sort. DNA extraction is completed to enrich for the DNA. Uh, we then uh, hydrolyze that DNA and uh, into individual nuclear bases. Uh, those individual um, uh, nucleotides might contain or not contain the addict. Uh, so therefore, we have an enrichment step that is uh, typically completed to uh, exclude the non-modified bases. And then we can focus our identification efforts on the modified uh, uh, bases and uh, uh, try to identify what we're dealing with. Uh, a exemplary case, um, so I work with Rob Tereski here at the Masonic Cancer Center. Uh, one area of interest in research, a large amount of research that he has done is related to the cooked meat carcinogen, uh, FIP. Uh, FIP uh, will, uh, it has implications of prostate cancer. Uh, FIP will modify guanine, deoxyguanosine. Uh, and after that modification, uh, if you look at this particular case, uh, we can inject it into the mass spectrometer, uh, lightly bombard it with some energy and knock off that ribose and produce what we call an A glycone. And in that process, we produce two um, mass peaks. And this is what uh, we needed new software to help us mine uh, the deluge of data that we were going to be experiencing uh, as we expanded our efforts into uh, more clinical-based studies in humans. And so what we're looking for is a characteristic neutral loss. And there is software out there that can do this but we have different scanning technologies that were developed at the Masonic Cancer Center specific for the problem of uh, uh, detecting DNA addicts. So our goal is to discover and characterize the DNA addictome uh, in totality. Uh, you know, uh, what can we glean uh, from an individual sample uh, and uh, what sort of profile uh, that we could develop for those DNA addicts uh, how, how would they uh, uh, give us correspondence, for example, with a mutational profile for some, some patients as well? So um, the two technologies that were developed uh, here at the Masonic Cancer Center, they were adapted from, uh, you know, the worlds of uh, proteomics and metabolomics. Um, but we had to have some more specific uh, tuning technologies in the instrument uh, in order to leverage um, how, we, how we can best gain the information uh, about uh, the mass spectra uh, that is indicating to us that we're experiencing a DNA addict. Uh, so the first was uh, developed by um, uh, Sylvia Balbo and uh, her lab. Uh, uh, it's called uh, uh, Data Dependent Acquisition Constant Neutral Loss Screening uh, uh, coupled with uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, the advantage here is, uh, without going into too many details about the scanning methods and stuff, uh, all you really need to know is that one of the big advantages here is you can get structural uh, information um, at at the, uh, the cost of uh, less comprehensive sample uh, coverage. Uh, in the world of metabolomics and proteomics, we have something called data independent acquisition. Um, 
And that is more of a screen for everything in totality uh, from the sample. So we can screen for more uh, ions in a sample. Uh, but the problem with that is it's much more uh, computationally difficult to deal with the data, uh, but we get more comprehensive sample coverage. And the caveat, of course, is we don't get any structural information. And so therefore, a subsequent experiment is needed, often at the expense of, of uh, very uh, low quantities of samples, for example. Uh, so this particular approach in the right was adopted uh, from DIA technology. It's called wide sim MS2 or gas phase fractionated uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, developed by Jing Shou Guo, uh, Pete Villalta, and Rob Tereski. So, two novel uh, approaches for DNA adductomics needed uh, two novel software solutions. Um, like I said, we sit at the intersection between metabolomics and genomics, uh, but mechanistically and analytically, we're almost identical to metabolomics. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, analytical tools uh, available to us in metabolomics are only partially able to handle our types of data. Uh, so we had to come up with our own software uh, packages to handle the data and to algorithmically process it and spit out a candidate uh, li or lists of candidate molecules uh, that we call putative DNA addicts at that point. Um, so the first one that was produced and just published uh, not too long ago is by Kevin Murray and Sylvia Balba's lab. Uh, and his uh, uh, software is incorporated into a, a well-known uh, metabolomic software package called MZMine. Um, he looks for uh, diagnostic uh, neutral losses in their data uh, uh, for, that, for that type of scanning technology. Um, the rest of the talk, I'll be focusing more on the DIA uh, white SIM MS2 type of data. And so for my approach, uh, we had to come up with uh, a software package that we developed in R uh, that would um, do a number of things that uh, current software in a metabolomics wor uh, world uh, was failing for us, okay? Uh, so current software uh, structurally is just, has been incompatible with the type of data that we produce uh, for our approach. Uh, another problem with current uh, software that's available to us is there is a step called feature finding by which if one of these mass peaks represents um, a DNA addict uh, entering a mass spectrometer, and as it increases in time coming off what, what they call a, a chromatographic column and then decreases over time, uh, there are known algorithms that could help fit a curve to this, but unfortunately our data uh, does is our type of data is not really amenable to those curve fitting algorithms. So we had to come up with something new there. Um, in addition, just the overall structure of the data, uh, we had to piece together multiple scans across multiple acquisition windows and multiple mass ranges, uh, which most software is um, not yet a program to do. So we had two, two major tasks we had to do, create compatibility uh, with, the, with the data structure and um, uh, create a new method of uh, feature finding. Ultimately, the goal of the software is global detection of DNA addicts in a single um, uh, mass spectrometry experiment um, for one single sample. So to put proof, uh, 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 concept to proof, um, to be sure that we were uh, actually mining uh, for and, and could actually uh, uh, detect these DNA addicts using our algorithm, uh, we spiked into a background of calf thymus DNA uh, cocktail of known DNA addicts uh, that are important to the research in, in the laboratories here. Uh, they include FIP, they include avenobiphenyl and A-alpha-C. Uh, a lot of these are um, carcinogens related to tobacco smoke and, and uh, dietary intake. Um, you can see on the left, uh, when we detect FIP, as I alluded to earlier, in our initial stage of detection of the molecule before we sense that it's a DNA addict, uh, we're dealing with very low, often very low uh, abundance uh, peaks. Uh, if we were to try to do uh, this in uh, traditional software, we would produce a lot of false positives, 
uh, in our feature finding. Um, and so uh, our software overcomes that issue. Um, this is also important because we're dealing often with trace level um, detection of DNA addicts from human samples. And so being able to dig further down into the noise, level of noise in mass spectrometry <clears throat> was extremely important for us. So to put proof to, uh, uh, to put this principle uh, to proof, uh, we were able to spike in at various levels, uh, realistic levels, uh, all the way down to um, about one in 10 to the eighth uh, nucleotide detection. So that's one single mutation in a string of 10 to the eighth nucleotides sample. We can back calculate that that's the amount we injected for a number of different uh, carcinogens into a, uh, or spiked in into a background sample. Uh, to really put proof uh, that what we are detecting um, in a real system uh, works and that we can detect these in a living organism, um, we wanted to say that in rats, if we uh, interperitoneally uh, inject them with a uh, cocktail of carcinogens, uh, that we would see the, uh, we would be able to track the incorporation of those carcinogens uh, uh, as they uh, mutate the DNA. And that using this technology, we can hopefully detect uh, the altered DNA. Uh, and so if we take a very similar cocktail to what I demonstrated uh, before, and you put them into rats, uh, and then over time, uh, you excise, after a little while, you excise their, uh, you extract their livers and the DNA and perform the entire mass spectrometry experiment. Then you run it through um, uh, the, uh, the software. Uh, we can indeed see that, we certainly see that uh, we can detect uh, our known spike ins uh, for um, the rat model. A uh, little bit about identification that we'll get into uh, later on, um, and that's just that uh, uh, in follow-up experiments, our goal is in the initial experiment to come up with a list of, of these known mutagens or possible mutated uh, DNA, um, uh, DNA addicts, and uh, go back and identify them, right? And so here's a case where we actually have a library entry that we've produced using a pure standard, and so we can go back and uh, later in a subsequent experiment identify uh, with, with high confidence uh, this particular DNA addict. Um, what's very surprising, well, maybe not so surprising, is that when we look uh, at the overall profile, we start to see that um, the knowns are just a very small part of the picture. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns potentially uh, even something in something as simple as a rat model. So uh, there are many different explanations where uh, DNA addicts uh, can be derived upon exposure from uh, carcinogens, but there are other routes of uh, exposure uh, as well, uh, perhaps from nutritional sources and so forth. So what we see here is just a uh, landscape map of our control vistas are, are treated. And so one way of looking at our data now is uh, we can either look at our, our control samples individually, or we can, because of the software, being able to process this type of data into algorithmically um, score and enrich for what we think are DNA uh, addicts in the data, um, we can now align it align those DNA addicts uh, using more traditional methods uh, borrowed from the metabolomics and perform our statistics. And so what you see here is an amalgamation of what we have detected across a uh, minimum of 50% of our uh, control versus uh, uh, treated uh, samples, or 67% uh, actually, two thirds. So when we start to put, um, uh, start to uh, apply the software in the real scenario, we're really interested in looking at human samples. We know we can uh, spike in uh, uh, a carcinogen cocktail into a background in vitro assay and detect them. The algorithm does it. We know that we can um, also see the bioincorporation and the mutation via an animal model. We can't couldn't really do that in humans. And so now that that proof of uh, principle works for us, uh, we have a pretty strong foundation of which we can start screening human samples. And so one uh, area of study that we are interested in with Rob Tresky's group is um, how FIP uh, produces uh, uh, 
uh, mutations in in prostate samples. Uh, we know that that happens, and it, it happens uh, from cooked uh, red meat, and also can happen from tobacco um, tobacco usage. Um, what we have is a study of uh, four independent uh, prostate, human prostate samples uh, from the tumor adjacent tissue from the transition zone. Uh, we were able to detect indeed FIP. We knew FIP was there. Um, and again, to exemplify how important it's going to be looking forward with these types of tools, um, what we observed were way many more unknowns, unknown putative DNA addicts than known DNA addicts. And so our known DNA addicts for a typical sample, uh, this is an amalgamation of, of uh, four samples, for example, uh, but um, we're only seeing maybe, you know, several hundred across uh, that are observable across a large number of samples. If we were to look at these samples individually, uh, we might see upwards of several hundred or even a thousand uh, in some cases, uh, uh, unknown DNA addicts. So very interesting. So how do we identify that stuff? Uh, we have an ongoing effort right now. Uh, Jean Shu Guo uh, here at, on, on our, in our program at the uh, Masonic Cancer Center. Uh, she's working with Pete Blot, uh, myself and Rob. Um, we are putting together a, a fragmentation database of as many known DNA addicts uh, that we can find. Our idea is that if we can help more readily identify the known DNA addicts using mass spectrometry and, and the tools that we develop, um, we can spend less effort on confirming their identity and more effort on, on trying to confirm the identity of the true unknown DNA addicts. Um, so, uh, Basically for this, we've written a, or I've written a uh, customized uh, uh, workflow that puts together or assembles consensus spectra, uh, as well as uh, takes individual spectra from a chemically pure DNA addict or near pure uh, DNA addict that has been injected into a mass spectrometer. We apply it across, uh, we apply collision energies across uh, about uh, 10 different energy levels and we get a myriad of different uh, spectral profiles or fragmentation profiles for these DNA addicts. Um, there are about 170 addicts uh, being collected from uh, worldwide contributors. And so this is truly, uh, uh, there's a lot of interest, uh, broadly speaking, uh, internationally. Uh, we also personally have collaborations with uh, Thermo Scientific uh, to put um, our raw data up into their tool called MC Cloud. Our approach is meant to uh, make it more open source uh, and more searchable in batch mode. So being able to take a sample and take our spectral library and identify uh, hundreds, uh, hopefully, of different compounds or DNA addicts in your particular sample. Uh, just to show how this works, um, we can look at data from our previous uh, Whiteson City screening. Uh, we are looking at here on, on the left, uh, upper left is aminobiphenyl as modified as it has modified deoxyguanosine, and we can come up with a library search result based on our library search, uh, our library uh, development. On the bottom, DGC8-FIP, it's just another exemplary case for a uh, common mutagen that we're interested in the lab. Um, same thing in human prostate tumor adjacent tissue. Uh, for that case, we've identified DGCA FIP along with another uh, couple of other molecules. Uh, but what's very interesting um, is that as we look forward to how we can do uh, adectomics, um, uh, we have to really have a strong consideration for the unknowns in our data because the vast majority of the DNA addicts that we are encountering are likely unknowns. Uh, there are inferences uh, within these spectra that can kind of guide us into the direction into what type of muted, uh, mutated uh, uh, bases that we're dealing with. And so, for example, um, uh, fragment ions would be encountered that might indicate that we're dealing with a modified uh, deoxyadenosine. Uh, we see that on the upper left. There's a signature ion for deoxyadenosine here. Um, down here, we can see that we're likely dealing with a, a deoxyguanosine. Uh, 
Uh, on the upper right, we're dealing with a slightly different type of modification uh, called uh, uh, Theno DA moiety. And so uh, what we're looking forward to in the near future is how to incorporate this extra information so that we can not only deal with our knowns, but also guide uh, uh, resources researchers into making uh, uh, likely uh, good choices as to what they think uh, their mutagen that they are dealing with is. So I'd like to uh, now show a, an exemplary case of some work uh, that we're doing. We're doing several uh, clinical studies. Um, one of the exemplary cases is related to ristolosic acid nephropathy. Um, we're using the white sim uh, DIA mass spectrometry technology uh, to screen patients. We're also using uh, uh, the WSIM City to provide guidance as to what the DNA addicts are in the data. Um, and then we're attempting to push forward an identification of some of the unknowns and knowns in that particular data. Uh, what is uh, uh, the importance of aristolosic acid? Uh, so aristolosic acid uh, causes uh, rare uro urothelial carcinomas of the upper ur urinary tract. Um, this is an example of exposomal um, uh, exposure um, from dietary intake. Uh, so in some cases, the dietary intake of uh, aristolosic acid is purpose purposeful. Uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, patients in Taiwan, uh, it is found as an additive inside of a herbal remedy. Um, and then in the case of uh, non-purposeful exposure uh, in the Balkans, for example, there is something called Balkan endemic nephropathy, and it is accidentally incorporated into the food supply uh, via uh, a, a grains, and that gets incorporated into uh, flour and then is eventually ingested through uh, bread, for example. Uh, Ristolosic acid induces a very uncommon uh, A to T to T to A uh, transversion in the P53 oncogene. Uh, there are other cancer driver genes throughout the genome in patients with UUC that also has some transversions as well. Um, and uh, chronic kidney disease is also frequently accompanied by UUC. And so what's interesting is even though uh, UUC, uh, upper ur uh, uh, urinary tract uh, 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 tumor might not be in a kidney, we can actually look in the kidney for indicators of exposure to uh, risolosic acid. So the method of incorporation essentially here is the risolactam uh, attacks the uh, intact DNA, uh, causes the DNA addict. This is what we detect here. Um, eventually, hopefully the uh, uh, addict, uh, well not hopefully, um, eventually the addict persists and causes a replication error. Hopefully that does not happen, but when it does happen, it causes a single base uh, substitution to occur. So for an experiment like this, uh, we would uh, start with our renal cortex tissue, perform our DNA extractions, uh, perform DNA addict analysis by white sim and S2 and mine the data using the software. Uh, then also through a collaboration uh, with um, uh, Tom Rosenquist at Stony Brook University and uh, uh, name, uh, another collaborator over in Taiwan, uh, we look for uh, single base substitution mutations in clusters. And I'll talk briefly about that. And there's some exciting uh, evolution of, of the data that uh, we receive from them and how it corresponds with the data that we produce. Okay. So the advantage again of our approach is, well, we can just do uh, traditional statistics if we want now on DNA addicts and DNA addictomics, so sample-wise DNA addict profiling. Um, we can categorize our uh, groups based on cohorts. And so one important confounding factor for us uh, is whether or not patients are still, still smoking or have ceased smoking or never smoked. Uh, the other confounding, uh, not confounding factor, but another uh, factor in our uh, patient data profiles is whether or not they are currently showing um, 
persist, uh, persistent uh, levels of uh, 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 DA AL1, which is our modified uh, deoxyadenosine that has been modified by aristolochic acid. So we can do that. Um, but even more exciting, um, if we were to compare our results um, to the mutational signatures um, uh, born out of uh, genomic sequencing efforts for these same patients, uh, we would see that via single base substitution mutational profiles, we would see that their mutation uh, signatures are indicative of a number of different causes important to uh, uh, cancer. Um, the one uh, that, that shows up as really important for us is uh, exposure to aristolochic acid. Uh, I have to mention uh, the aristolochic acid is considered a uh, level one carcinogen, um, and, and uh, it's uh, uh, been banned by the FDA. Um, but you can still find it uh, online, for example, in, in uh, remedies and tinctures, so on and so forth. Uh, the nice thing is, is that when we apply our methodology uh, to uh, uh, compare, when we actually compare our methodology to the mutational signature, uh, we allow the mutational signature to drive what samples um, are uh, producing uh, aristolochic acid or have aristolochic acid in them. We can detect that with a fairly high correlation based on our mass spectrometry based approach. Okay. So our future directions are to uh, really the big picture is to be able to apply this software to age to aid large population screening. Uh, we want to help advance the understanding of the impact of DNA adductomics toward understanding the causes, or excuse me, the causes and the mechanisms of disease and how we can asso associate this uh, signatures of DNA addict profiles with disease risk. Uh, ultimately, in the long run, being able to inform patient status by understanding how mutation profiles inform DNA addict profiles, in other words, what the mutagens are and vice versa and uh, enabling patient DNA out of profiles towards personalized medicine. Um, and that's it. Uh, so we have a number of people uh, involved in uh, all of this work. Uh, Rob and Jing Shu and Pete and Sylvia at the Masonic Cancer Center uh, and Kevin Murray too has developed that software for Sylvia's approach. Uh, Jinhua Wang works uh, uh, closely with me on the informatics side. Um, and of course, we gain uh, um, access to uh, uh, prostate samples, for example, uh, from our collaborators over in urology and pathology. Um, our friends over at Stony Brook University, Tom Rosenquist, is predominantly uh, working on the mutational cluster analysis. And uh, Shun Sin Shen um, it has been the source of our patient uh, samples for the uh, AAN studies. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Walmsley. Um, to all of our participants, um, as a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, add those questions to the Q&A box, and we will get to them during the uh, panel discussion uh, portion of our symposium, which will take place at 1 o'clock p.m. Central Time. So um, thank you again very much uh, again, uh, Dr. Walmsley, and we will move on to our final speaker for today. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Gilbert Oman. Uh, Dr. Oman is the Harold T. Shapiro Distinguished University Professor of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics, Internal Medicine, Human Genetics, and Public Health. And he is also the founding director of the Center uh, for Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. His research is focused on proteogenomics and bioinformatics of cancers. He has served as the president of the United States Human Proteome Organization, and he has also served on the council for the, um, its international counterpart, the Human Proteome Organization. Um, for the past decade, he has led the Human Proteome Project. Um, he previously worked on biochemical genetics of the brain, cancer prevention, health promotion, and disease prevention for older adults, and science and health policy. 
He is an author of 620 publications with 39,000 citations and H index of 81. And he is either an, an editor or an author of 18 books. He was a White House fellow at the United States Atomic Energy Commission, um, the associate director of the White House Office of Science and Technology, um, policy, um, excuse me, Science and Technology Policy, and the Office of Management and Budget. And he's also um, formerly president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He chaired the Presidential Congressional Commission on Risk Assessment and Risk Management in the 1990s. Um, he's also served on the board of Amgen for 27 years and Roman Haas Company for 22 years. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he is also a fellow of the American College of Physicians and AAAS. He received the Walsh McDermott Medal from the National Academy of Medicine and the David E. Rogers Award from the Association of American Medical Colleges. He holds a BA from Princeton, an MD from Harvard, and a PhD in genetics from the University of Washington. And perhaps his most notable accomplishments, he has three, he has three children and seven grandkids, and he is a musician and a tennis player. Um, Dr. Oman, we are really delighted to have you join us today, and we're looking forward to your presentation, and the Zoom podium is now yours, and we can see your slides. Well, Stefani, thank you so much for that ex excessive introduction. It was very nicely delivered, and I'm uh, engaged in most of those activities still, so it's really wonderful. I'm particularly pleased to be on this program with my longtime friend and colleague, Mike Snyder, and our alum from University of Michigan, Scott. So uh, look forward to the final talk and then the panel. I was in Minnesota three years ago for the uh, uh, US HUPO meeting that you hosted there, your colleagues did, and I uh, have a very high regard for folks at uh, your university. I understand that this uh, symposium is jointly sponsored by the molecular pathologists and the computational pathologists, which is a terrific combination and very much the nature of my talk. So my title here, as you see, is celebrating two major milestones for the uh, Human Proteome Organization, Human Proteome Project, HPP. First, that we have achieved a really major milestone of uh, identifying and validating confidence identification of 90%, now well over 90% of the predicted proteins based upon the genome. And secondly, as an example, of the kind of work going on under the Human Proteome Project and in relation to the Human Proteome Project, I wanna give a deep dive to one example of the many proteogenomic analyses of particular cancers in the CPTAC program of the National Cancer Institute. And I'll mention now and several times later, the use of the term cancers in the plural. It's one of the biggest recognitions of the last decades since the war on cancer that we have to think about cancers as very, very many different disorders, mechanisms, and treatment strategies, prevention strategies. Okay, um, I do need somehow to progress the slides. Let's make sure this is working. Okay, so here are my obligatory disclosures and none are related to this lecture. The current public company boards are shown, and I'm optimistic about all of them. Okay, overriding goals of the Human Proteome Project. First is to complete in stepwise fashion, the protein parts list. We wanna identify and characterize at least one protein product and as many post-translational modifications, sequence variants called SNPs, or splice isoforms as possible from each of the now 19,773 human protein coding genes. We wanna find the proteins that are still, quotes, missing, quotes. We wanna characterize the known proteins and the newly identified proteins. And we also wanna predict or understand why some proteins appear to be undetectable. Second big strategy is to make proteomics a full counterpart to genomics. Genomics assays, that's to say not really genomics, but transcriptomics assays with RNA-seq and hybridization have become so well distributed and, and easy to perform that uh, too often 
multi-omic studies leave out the proteomics because it's a different kind of uh, laboratory that's required. And as uh, Scott just showed, uh, there's a lot of mass spec expertise that can be brought to bear. Anyway, there's been tremendous work across the entire biomedical research community with new instruments, reagents, pre-analytical preparation techniques, and especially the knowledge bases for identification, quantitation, and characterization of proteins, and not just to find the protein, but to put them in pathways and networks and meaningful context for systems biology, systems medicine, and uh, what we call scientific wellness in the discussion we just heard from Mike Snyder. I don't know how many of you have copies of these two issues of Science and Nature or have seen them, but they are classics and landmarks. If you have copied, make sure to protect it for your collection. 20 years ago, almost exactly 20 years ago, these two appeared on a weekend in February. The Public Sector and Private Sector Human Genome Sequencing Project Publications with multiple interpretive articles each. At the time, it was called the completion of the human genome sequencing, but it was actually 90% is what was claimed. And a year earlier, when there was a big public event with President Clinton in the last year of his presidency and Tony Blair, the prime minister of Britain, uh, it was actually 85%. That's important for our celebration of this milestone for the human proteome. Despite the impact and importance of those two covers, look what appeared five days later in the Financial Times of London, February 21, 2001, 20 years ago, searching for the real stuff of life. The discovery that humans have far fewer genes than expected has thrust proteins into the research spotlight, it says. And on the stage, is an active, cheerful, globular protein. When I present this to a live audience, I say, and where is the double helix DNA? And many people are puzzled, but I hope you can see <clears throat> that it's right there at arm's length from the protein, sort of in the shadows, being pushed off stage as it were. <clears throat> of course, it's not off stage, but we need both the genome and the proteome to make sense of biology and medicine. And as the Business Week article says, biotech's next holy grail is to decipher the human protein set. Well, that year was a banner year for proteins. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to the three men listed for introducing new methods of mass spectrometry and NMR with the announcement that chemists can now rapidly and reliably identify what proteins a sample contains and understand how they function in the cells. Well, that's quite a statement. It's making chemical biology into big science with big data. And that's where we are these days. I hope you all know what I've summarized in this slide, that the path from the genome to our phenome phenotypes, outward or measurable appearance and function goes through the proteome. Proteins are the major action molecules of cells. Proteins and their many isoforms are dynamic, unlike the genes, which normally are two copies of each gene per cell. Proteins play critical roles in gene regulation. Proteins are the primary targets of many drugs and can be drugs themselves, as well as biomarkers of disease. And as I've already indicated, modern developments in mass spectrometry and many other fields have now facilitated integration and modeling of data from multiple omics platforms that include the proteome. And here's our depiction from a decade ago from the University of Michigan National Center for Integrative Biomedical Informatics, NCIBI, uh, from the genome to the phenome, or starting from the phenome and going all the way back through the organs, tissue, cells, proteome, micro RNAs, methylated DNAs and histones, transcriptome, copy number variants to the genome. 
And I've put under the clinical phenome, the microbiome, which is our uh, environment within our environment, which is the microbial partners in our bodies. Now the Human Protein Project got launched in 2011. Uh, it was announced in 2010, the bottom of the slide. Uh, actually the origins, the foundations for the Human Protein Project were the initial initiatives of HUPO itself, which was founded in 20, 10 years earlier in 2001. The goals of HUPO then and now were to accelerate progress across the whole developing field of proteomics, to engage people in collaborations and data sharing uh, globally, and to stimulate young people to get excited about the possibilities of coming into this area of proteomics and to connect it with the rest of omics research and applications. Well, during that first decade, we had multiple biofluid and organ proteome projects, plasma, liver, brain, kidney and urine, cardiovascular. I had the lead on the plasma and colleagues all around the world led these other projects. We also had the orange of what we're gonna call the resource pillars, protein standards for data, the human antibodies initiative, which, which was the human protein atlas and the human glycoprotein initiative primarily led in Japan. By 2008, at the annual HUPO World Congress, we agreed to create a human proteome project. It would be a convening and data sharing operation and would not compete uh, with our own investigators or the rest of the community for national or international funding. And as I say, it was announced in Sydney in 2010 and launched during the next year. Well, this is what has evolved. You can see at the left of this slide, the four pillars, mass spectrometry, knowledge base, antibodies, and now pathology. The yellowish greenish ellipses around CHPP refers to the chromosome centric human proteome project. These are 24 chromosome teams and a mitochondrial proteome team. So 25 groups, very widely distributed internationally. And if you can make out the slide, tried to make it as visible as I could. Uh, you can see that many countries are represented among these 25 groups. Um, the blue ellipses above are the biology and disease-driven human proteome project. There are 19 of those groups and they represent uh, disease categories and certain conditions like extreme environmental conditions or uh, protein aggregation or mitochondria again. <clears throat> the idea is to have these teams working on their own agendas and connect them within their sets and cross the biology and chromosome groups. We were aware from the very beginning that there were challenges to looking at proteins by chromosome genes for sequencing the, the uh, sequence of DNA down the chromosome because uh, many multi-protein pathways in signaling and metabolism, of course, have the genes for those proteins on multiple chromosomes. But there are some that are connected and there are many interesting cis phenomena like amplification of uh, adjacent uh, protein coding genes so there was plenty of, bio, plenty of biology involved in charging the chromosome groups to start looking for what could be found with their set of proteins. Now, I wanna spend several slides on data sharing, data quality, and data guidelines, because these have been critical to the success of the HBP and the progress of the whole field of proteomics. In the early years, uh, there were many claims about proteins detected, which had to be revised because it was based, based on as few as six amino acid peptides or peptides that mapped to multiple protein sequences and all were counted or they would be lumped together as a protein group, many varieties. And of course, there were many, many claims 
of detecting from spectra when the spectra did not fully justify the peptide sequence. So I'm not gonna go into all those problems, just to say that they have been largely resolved through a tremendous effort throughout the whole community of which the HPP played a key role. We advocated successfully for public release of data sets and the metadata, the description of the experiments, and that that should be registered in a new resource created at the European Biomatics, Bioinformatics Institute called Proteome Exchange, coming right up. <clears throat> Under the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, Peptide Atlas was created, and in much more recent time, Massif and San Diego, to perform standardized reanalysis from the raw data of the human data sets that were available. And then the HPP guidelines enhanced data quality, markedly reduced false positive rates, generate a high stringency proteome for use by the entire community. These are the basic data questions. How many of the protein coding genes, or how many of them do we have confident evidence of a protein product? <clears throat> Conversely, for those which we classify as missing or inadequately documented at the protein level, how many remain to be found and characterized? How many of these missing proteins are predictably not detectable by mass spectrometry, perhaps because the sequence does not yield any triptych peptides or any triptych peptides of the useful length? And finally, what are the attributes of the leading data repositories and knowledge bases for the launch and deliverables of the HPP? Well, these are the main data resources. Ensemble for the genome and Uniprot, Swissprot, Nexprot provide the number of predicted protein coding genes. <clears throat> Peptide Atlas, I just mentioned, documents high confidence proteins identified through mass spectrometry after the standardized reanalysis of the transproteomic pipeline from the raw data, similarly for Massif. Nexprot, provides the official metrics for the HPP, incorporating and curating data from mass spectrometry, as well as biochemical evidence, protein structure, protein-protein interactions, and also antibody profiling. And the Human Protein Atlas describes the tissue expression and intracellular localization of proteins based upon immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence with polyclonal antibodies, as well as the quantitation of transcripts in 66 cell types and 48 tissues. This is the next pro protein evidence classification system. PE1 means high confidence, in their words, gold level, protein evidence of expression of the predicted protein. In our terms, it means they meet, they comply with all of our guidelines. PE2 means there is evidence of transcript expression, but no or insufficient evidence at the protein level. PE3 means evidence only from non-human species, PE4 only from certain gene models. And there is also a PE5 in Nexpro, which they classify as dubious evidence, primarily related to pseudogenes, which have a, a duplicate expressed locus elsewhere in the genome. They are not included, PE5, in our HPP totals of predicted proteins. For experimental data sets, the HUPO Protein Standards Initiative long ago set standards for reporting data. All HPP original data sets must be registered in the Proteum Exchange and submitted to one of the repositories, Pride, Massif, PASO, especially for what we call SRM. I'll come to that later. The Proteome Exchange PXD identifier must appear in the last line of the abstract with a login provided for reviewers and readers, uh, at least for the Journal of Proteome Research and recommended for other journals. And then Proteome Exchange links, as I'll show you in the next slide, with all these resources. So here you see in the sort of... Uh, uh, iPhone style rectangle, uh, Proteome Exchange with 
Pride in UK, Massive in San Diego, Paso in Seattle, Panorama in Seattle, J Post in Japan, and missing in this particular is IPROX, which is in China. The crucial thing is to recognize that these data sets from the left come all from all through the community, as well as the specific <clears throat> HPP investigators in the BD and CHPP teams. This then feeds the reanalysis at Bipeptide Atlas and Massif, and we apply our analysis and categorization in the five levels, really the PE1234 that we utilize for the HPP at NEXPRO. We also feed in the Human Protein Atlas, and we bring it all together with the guidelines I'm going to show you now. So the original guidelines, the quality standards for version one were to be fully transparent about the spectra and to make sure we had high quality, that the investigators had high quality of spectra with as close to the full B and Y series ions as possible. Then there should be manual inspection of the spectra, especially when there were claims of having identified a previously missing, meaning PE2, 3, or 4 protein, or some kind of a novel protein, perhaps from non-coding RNA sequences. In this first version, we required a minimum of seven amino acids in length. Many people had no such minimum requirement. That's since been raised. And very importantly, besides false discovery rates for spectra and for peptides, we insisted, and we continue to insist, a protein level FDR at less than or equal to 1%. This is extremely important because if someone reports, uh, let's say 10 new previously undetected proteins and if FDR is 10%, well then one of those is suspect just statistically. If they pour a hundred new, a bigger, much bigger number, at one, even at 1%, let alone 5 or 10% would be suspect. And it's been a big problem. The world has now accepted the 1% threshold. <clears throat> For newly discovered previously missing proteins, it's very important, and we stress this in subsequent versions of the guidelines, to consider alternative matches to abundant proteins, because the peptides very commonly will match to more than one protein in the reference proteome. And that's due to sequence variants or isobaric PTMs of very abundant, well-known, regularly reported proteins. This is version two, five years later. Um, guidelines process have been led by my colleague, Eric Deutsch at the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, and many people around the world have participated actively. So we created the checklist for the journals, for the submitting authors and for the reviewers to be clear of what has been complied with and what is still to be requested. We acquire all the MS proteomics data, whether it's uh, all different kinds of MS data to be put into proteome exchange and appropriate repository. And then to use the most recent version of the next quote reference, which is updated various times, but regularly at the start of the calendar year for our annual cycle of the HPP, which has been very good discipline. And finally, as I said, uh, to make sure to comply with the FDR at the protein level 1%, 0.1. So the guidelines were particularly important for claims of the new PE1 protein being detected, previously missing proteins or novel coding elements. Um, we consider all the points I just mentioned, plus review of uh, mass accuracy, highest uh, signal to noise ratio, clearly annotated spectra of synthetic peptides synthesized to match the spectra supporting the extraordinary detection claims. And nowadays we even have a spectral identifier process to be able to facilitate matching spectra. As I've just said, 
if uh, the uh, spectra may be synthesized chemically or can be verified using the SRM Atlas, which the HPP BD groups developed uh, and published in 2016. I'll come to that later. Finally, with this question of mapping to other proteins in the protein reference, uh, NextPro created a uniqueness checker, which enables you to just put in your sequence for the purported peptide you've identified and see if in fact it can be explained with well-known proteins before being uh, used to identify a protein not previously reliably detected. This is a very important development. And in 2019, we had, a, a, I would say, just a further refinement of the guidelines, version 3.0, which streamlined and reorganized the previous guidelines that I summarized. Uh, also addressed the new work with the DIA and SWATH MS. We heard quite a lot about DIA from Scott a few minutes ago. It included this new feature of the universal spectrum identifier, which greatly facilitates comparing spectra. It encouraged the search for C or N terminal peptides, semi-triptych peptides, when less than two triptych peptides are available in the sequence because we require a minimum of two triptych peptides or two peptides of at least nine amino acids in length. If they are partially nested, then the total length must be greater than 18. And we also distinguish stranded peptides in one data repository from singleton peptides that are well documented in Peptide Atlas. And finally, we address the question, which is quite interesting genomically, that there are multiple gene entries for a number of proteins, a total of 118 entries for 51 distinct protein sequences where the proteins are identical, but the genes are different probably, usually because of changes in the promoter region, maybe tissue specific. And here's about the spectrum identifier. It addresses what was recognized to be quite a widespread problem, that requests for annotated spectrum evidence resulted in PDF screenshots or other renderings that really were not useful for close inspection or reanalysis. Even if full raw data are available, reanalysis may not reproduce the finding. So without a spectrum identifier, it's hard to know which spectrum was the claimed evidence. And there's a useful link here. So now let's turn to the data. This is the pattern over eight annual cycles of next pro uh, ratings of the evidence for human proteins. The first row under the headers, protein evidence level one, is what I just described a few minutes ago as evidence at the protein level. And when we uh, launched this project, there were about 14,000. We are now up over 17,000. I'll show you the just hot off the press number updating this table in a few slides. And then you can see that the evidence at transcript level only has gone down remarkably from over 5,000 to 1,596. And the total of PE234, all of which are lacking sufficient evidence at the protein level, has gone from 5,500 to 1,899. That represents 90% of the predicted proteins now being found at the protein level, PE1. And extensive articles, very extensive articles about this have now appeared in Nature Communications from our entire group, in JPR, our annual paper from the HUPO leadership, and a special uh, reflections I was asked to write about the 10 years history of the uh, HPP, which just came out last, last month in molecular and cellular proteomics. Here's a nice way of showing the progress of the last five years. The green represents PE1. That's to say PE1 based on mass spectrometry. The yellow 
slightly orange, represents the PE1 based on all the other kinds of evidence of high quality that's been curated by Nextpro to meet our standards for PE1 protein evidence. And you can see the green has grown, the yellow has diminished. In fact, the yellow has diminished quite remarkably because more and more of the PE1 from other, other non-MS evidence have now been found very reliably with mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry has become more sensitive and the data process has become much more specific. The red or crimson color in contrast, labeled MP for missing proteins, that's PE234, has declined remarkably from 2949 in 2016 to 1899 in 2020. So the total of green plus yellow is 90.4% similar to what the Human Genome Project reached in the year 2001, and the uh, missing proteins are under 10%. Here's another way of showing that in a pie chart. So the red is the missing proteins. The yellow, as in the previous slide, are the non-MS PE1, and the green are the MS PE1. And if you're curious, you can see where those 950 remaining non-NMS PE1 proteins were justified uh, from protein-protein interactions, from Edmund degradation, post-generational modifications, disease mutations, 3D structures, antibodies, and various other biochemical studies. And here is something we include in the annual publication, uh, which is this, I think, very nice bar chart that shows you where the increment in canonical proteins in peptide atlas was derived by publication. And as you can see here, the substantial increase in, in canonical proteins was led by 99 from a high sensitivity reanalysis of the much studied HeLa proteome and from a, a concatenation of many studies uh, of healthy tissues. This is another rather complicated figure, which our next pro colleagues do for us each year, uh, to show how the, what was the dynamic of the flow of PE1 proteins and PE2, 3, 4 missing proteins. And the big number here, if you start from 2129 on the left, missing MP, that's missing proteins, PE2, 3, 4, you can see the green goes up, 255 became PE1, it was a banner year. And even after a time we had started to worry that maybe it's gonna be very hard to find the remaining ones because they hadn't been found to date. And maybe they just uh, are in hydrophobic proteins or lack cryptic peptides or in tissues that we haven't studied and so forth. This is a kind of figure, it's in the JPR paper. And I recommend it to those of you who are interested in the in-depth analysis, it's quite revealing but quite complicated to simply describe. Another question you might ask, what about protein families, groups of proteins? And here's a, a very interesting set of six families uh, from Mark Baker and Australia and colleagues. Starting at the right, going from right to left, you can see that the coil coil domain proteins, blue to red, 2013 to 2018, went way down. That means these are the missing ones. So those have been largely found. Same for curtain associated proteins, same somewhat similar, similar curve for homeobox proteins, developmental. Dramatic reduction in zinc finger proteins missing. But for the transmembrane proteins, not so much of a decrease. And for the olfactory receptor proteins of which there are 403 coding genes, not a single one has been found by mass spectrometry quite remarkable. They're GPCR receptors, they're embedded in membranes, they lack hydrophobic, they are highly hydrophobic, they lack lysines and arginines for cleavage to generate peptides from nine to 30 amino acids in length, et cetera. Maybe it's also biological and they're only made in certain cells in certain places in the olfactory cortex 
uh, on a clonal basis. So here is the, uh, what I promised, hot off the press expansion of our metrics table. You can see at the far right now, the PE level one is up to 18,357. And the MP, the missing proteins are all the way down to 1421. And the percentage has gone from 90.4 to 92.8% of the total uh, of 19,778 next pro predicted protein coding genes. So we're quite delighted about this. Why are proteins still missing? Well, there are unusual tissues and cell types. There are developmental stage, perhaps. Families with high homologies, so we can't distinguish the sequences that are available. The biggest problem is low or very low abundance, maybe high turnover proteins, uh, for which they're just not sensitive enough detection. And of course, as I've said several times, many proteins are hydrophobic, have unfavorable physical chemical properties. The strategy for that is for all of these is really to examine the RNA-seq data for evidence of gene expression and mRNA translation as a guide to which cell types, which organs to study for the missing proteins. And this has been done with the human protein atlas, the tissue-based proteome, which has been very productive. And that act they published five years ago. Here you can see where number six male tissue, it shows the um, uh, very large number of proteins for which there are transcripts expressed only in testis or only in testis and sperm and not elsewhere. And to a lesser extent in brain. And these are the gold mines, I think, for finding additional proteins still missing. Briefly, and now let's turn to the biology and disease-driven HPP, what we call the BD HPP. These folks produce the SRM atlas of, uh, uh, targeted for targeted mass spectrometry of proteotypic peptides for which synthetic peptides are now available and their spectral libraries are available for 99.8% of the predicted human proteins based upon the gene sequence. These folks also developed popular protein lists suitable for designing targeted proteomic studies, which are in increasing use throughout the broader research community across the organ systems identified. And they have taken the lead for all of the HPP and now the HUPO on uh, multiple initiatives for early career researchers to whom we are quite dedicated and also clinician scientists for whom we would like to have more translational applications. This is a literature search with, from the Human Proteome Reference Library. And you can see the numbers that cited specifically the HPP or the BD or CHPP. In the bottom frame, you can see among all the many, many thousands of papers on proteomics, the most uh, numerous are in the area of cancers. And that's where I'm gonna turn now. Oops. Yeah, that's okay. So I wanna talk about the Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium. This has been developing for 15 years at the US National Cancer Institute. The components are shown here. The Proteome Characterization Centers Data Generation, the Proteome Gen Proteogenomic Data Analysis Centers, which uh, do exactly what it says. And we have one of those centers here at the University of Michigan under Alexei Nezhvishky, who is the mentor of Scott Walmsley. Um, and then there's the Translational Research Centers and, addition, and uh, their corresponding trend, uh, data analysis centers, which we participate also. To date, uh, well, this slide was current a week ago at the uh, CPTAC meeting, but actually yesterday, one more uh, cell issue was published with uh, lung squamous cell carcinoma as the latest example of the, uh, of the uh, CPTAC cancer specific publications. What's going on here is for each different cancer type by organ. And in the case of lung, adenocarcinoma separate from squamous. And in the case of glioblastoma, pediatric separate from adult. We have had exhaustive studies 
of the genome, the chromosomes, let's say for translocations and fusions and copy number variation, methylation, microRNA in many cases, of course, RNA seq for transcripts, and then global proteomics, phosphoproteomics, and immunotyping with the tremendous developments around immunotherapy for cancers. You know, the biggest questions we have on the clinical side about oncology and about treating patients with various cancers is we do not understand enough to explain why one patient with a similar looking cancer to another responds to a certain chemotherapy regimen and the next patient does not. The same with the occasionally dramatic and durable responses to immunotherapy, which took 30 years of development to finally be successful in patients. And there are some remarkable recoveries of patients, including former President Jimmy Carter with his melanoma to the brain, which has been cured. And yet only a minority of patients, even in the organs where there is evidence of durable, complete response, only a minority respond so far. So this project is dedicated to understanding so much more about the omics biology and pharmacology of the cancers that we could be predictive and helpful for patients based upon molecular analyses, either of the tumor itself or circulating DNA or tumor cells. And as you can see here, there are altogether 14 uh, issues of cell or another cell family journal. Uh, we've had three covers and it's a remarkable output of a really high class program. Um, the, the top two rows are uh, NCI CPTAC. The bottom four are projects that are in a, the international version of CPTAC, which is called the International Cancer Proteomics Consortium. <clears throat> I wanna spend the rest of the talk telling you about one of these, which is the clear cell renal cell carcinoma. This is the dominant form of kidney cancers, about 75%. It's a quite important kind of cancer. Kidney is thought to be a relatively immune active organ some of the earliest work with IL-2 and other immune approaches were done with kidney cancers. And you can see on this uh, slide showing the puzzle that we're addressing. Uh, to the left is transcriptomics. In the center are chromosome translocations. To the right is genomics. The next part is proteomics, histopathology, immunosubtyping, and then phosphoproteomics and histopathology below. Continuing. First, the chromosomal features. And here, the most dramatic features are in frame B of this slide, where you can see, I hope, uh, translocations involving chromosome three, 3P three and 5Q, 3P loss, 5Q gain, or 3P and 2P or Q, really two, 3P and 2Q, or 3P loss and chromosome eight gain, or other translocations involving chromosome three. The vast majority of these cancers have chromosome, uh, have major chromosome abnormalities involving chromosome three. And in slide frame C, there are five critical tumor suppressor genes that are involved in these translocations. The first, can you see my, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not, but the top is the sum of the tumors that have these mutations. The next row is VHL, and you can see that is about 70% of the cancers. And then PBRM1, BAP1, those are either or, never both in the same cancer. And then SETD2 and KDM5C. And these become very important in terms of their pathways for detailed study and that's exactly what follows. <clears throat> Now here's a slide that shows what we call CISC cascades, where the findings on the, of the mRNA, the global proteome and the phosphoproteome are correlated. And for the four 
that are highlighted here, the YY1 and the other three in this slide, and they're, they're quite striking features that uh, um, sorry, that have been analyzed extensively in the published work. And they're critical to uh, targeting in the system. Here's another analysis looking at the metabolic features of clear cell renal cell carcinoma. <clears throat> First of all, you see in the frame A, the complete distinction between tumor and tumor adjacent, non normal adjacent tissue, NAT. To the right in slide section B, you see that the tumor is highly associated with hypoxia, angiogenesis, interferon gamma response, uh, EMT, that means epithelial mesenchymal transition, glycolysis, interferon alpha response, mTOR signaling, and complement cascade. In contrast, fatty acid metabolism, oxidative phosphorylation and the TCA cycle are much reduced in the cancers. And that is shown in a uh, detailed pathway diagram here in frame C for glycolysis in red has increased and Krebs cycle and related pathways decreased. <clears throat> now let's turn to phospho networks. This is very striking because there is no way to predict phosphorylation, let alone phosphorylation sites or networks from the genome or the transcriptome. But it's very important because so many of our active uh, chemotherapy agents attack kinases or their substrates. And this is crucial for control pathways and cancers. And I gave you, I'm gonna show this in a little depth. Here you see for AKT, which is very important for multiple pathways converging on cancers, the mRNA difference between normal adjacent tissue to the left and tumor to the right is quite modest. The corresponding phosphopeptide analysis for the peptide shown in this AKT protein is quite dramatic, the NAT does not overlap or barely overlaps the uh, 25th percentile of the phosphoprotein. Similarly, in SMAD3, the NAT and tumor overlap, whereas the phosphopeptide does overlap a little at the extreme, but is very markedly higher for this peptide than the mRNA. Now, and there are even cases, no surprise, where the phosphopeptide is much more informative than the global proteome peptide analysis. So leveraging differential phosphopeptide abundance across all the tumor samples, we identified several, multiple phosphopeptide co-expression networks. Two of them were modules involving cell cycle and or angiogenesis which were quite independent of the global proteomic and transcriptomic profiles. The cell cycle module included multiple cell cycle checkpoint proteins and also CDC20 representing another mechanism in mitotic arrest. Tumors with genomic instability particularly correlated with this module. The angiogenesis model included multiple elements associated with VEGF, NOTCH, and vascular development like PCAM1. This module is inversely correlated with BAP1, one of the tumor suppressor genes, and let's say with its mutations, and with chromosomes with uh, lower grades in the histology. What's important about this example is that this phosphoproteomic analysis identified multiple signal transduction pathways that are activated in tumors and provided evidence for expanding treatment selection beyond the currently FDA approved therapies for kidney cancers for CCRCC that primarily target 
VEGF, and mTOR. This is another way of showing this phosphorylation analysis. Here, I, I think you can see at the top of where it's marked B is VEGF receptor and EGFR receptor toward the middle. And what's interesting about this slide is for each of these potential targets, we have identified it in red, the drugs that are either approved or in trials for targeting either inhibiting or, well, in fact, all of these cases inhibiting the uh, target protein. And we make predictions for individual tumors for which drugs would be most likely to be effective for that patient's tumor. We can also make inferences and predictions for which combination of cancer drug, anti-cancer drugs might be most appropriate for that tumor in that patient. This is truly precision oncology. And it's where we're trying to take the field. The biggest challenge is that the tumors themselves are heterogeneous. So some groups are now progressing to single cell analysis using uh, CYTOF methods and other methods to identify the cells and not just do RNA-seq, but also detect and quantitate specific proteins of interest. This is cutting edge work, but the uh, stimulus for the clinic and for designing more specific trials uh, targeted on the appropriate proteins for a given patient's tumors is uh, compelling and very, very exciting. Here's the immune story where we want to figure out how to be more successful with immune therapy, as I mentioned also. If you look across the first row on, uh, next to A, there's red, blue, yellow, green. Those are the four immuno subtypes for clear cell renal cell carcinoma from these studies. The gray and pink to the right are the subtypes of the normal associated, normal adjacent tissue adjacent to the tumor, NAT. And you can see here in the proteomics region, there's not too much exciting. But if we go back to A, these dark red areas here under the red, and the blue and a little bit under the yellow are highly associated with dendritic cells, macrophages, CD4 plus memory cells, CD8 plus T regulatory cells. Uh, these are all very immune active cells plus fibroblast and epithelial cells from the stroma. And a tremendous amount of analysis is going into those parameters. Also, you can see to the right, the distribution of these four types of immuno patterns, red, blue, yellow, green, for the BAP1 mutation uh, and the PBRM1 mutation tumors, the chromosome seven gain, chromosome 14 loss. Each different kind of tumor has a different pattern of response. So we need to know the multiomics descriptors for each cancer. And here in, in much easier to read detail, are some highlights of these four immune subtypes. The CDH, I mean the CD8 inflamed, CD8 positive inflamed subtype is associated with PD1 and PDL1, CDL4, LA4. These are the, the big <clears throat> markers for immuno response and also a pattern of T cell exhaustion. Biochemically, it's interferon gamma signaling and evidence of mobilization of the antigen presenting machinery. To the right, the CD8 minus negative inflamed. So it has the infiltration of, of uh, immune cells and fibroblasts, and it has features of platelet degranulation of epithelial mesenchymal transition, mobilization of the complement cascade. And that's quite distinctive from the CD8 positive subtype. And then we have the metabolic immune desert which has pyruvate metabolism, mitochondrial metabolism. This is uh, an mTOR signaling. This is a highly oxidative phosphorylation subgroup. And finally, the VEGF immune desert with a substantial epithelial cell in invasion 
and angiogenesis, not signaling, RAP1 signaling, and somoylation, which is a protein degradation scheme. And overall, we map these four subgroups on a combination of stromal score on the x-axis and immune score on the top axis. We have multiple analyses going on across all the different kinds of cancers, looking at uh, immune phenotypes and mechanisms to try to distinguish for as many cancers as we can, the critical driving factors and the predictive factors for immunotherapy. Since we just had a talk about MS, and the Nezvishki lab, I wanted to just mention this remarkable development on the MS side, which has been applied extensively in the clear cell renal cell carcinoma and the other cancers now under CPTAC. This is from Alexei Nezvishki's lab, Andy Kong and many others in the lab now have contributed to MS Frager and the MS Frager glyco just out in the last few months. Uh, this generates through a fragment ion indexing method ultra fast comprehensive analysis of MS peptide spectra with matches to the protein sequence a hundred times faster and more spectra from APMS, affinity proteomics. And many of the teams are using this not just for phosphorylation, but for glycosylation as this latest paper shows and other folks are doing acetylation and ubiquitinylation so that we're gonna have much more information going forward about the roles of post-translational modifications in all of these tumors, I predict that they will be extremely informative. So here's the summary of the milestones of the uh, HPP announced in 2010, launched in 2011, 210 direct publications in the annual special issues of the Journal of Proteome Research, plus many, many more in specialty journals, quality assurance through the guidelines, has been very important contribution, as well as the data sharing. <clears throat> the SRM Atlas and the synthetic peptides have been another milestone. There's been fabulous progress on detecting and, and uh, qualifying missing, previously missing proteins as um, PE1 proteins and on annotating the functions of unannotated PE1 proteins. And there have been remarkable progress simultaneously in the human protein atlas for tissues, cells, pathology, brain, blood, metabolism. And of course, as I've already said, we've had this 2020 milestone of greater than 90%, now well over 92% of the predicted proteins now credibly detected. <clears throat> we have much more to do in the coming decade with continued progress along these directions of the parts list and the broad application of proteogenomics as I've illustrated with CPTAC and building the careers with young scientists. We want to do much more quantitative analysis of networks, pathways, and systems enhanced with machine learning and AI. We expect to have a growing role for proteomics and single cell and spatiotemporal analyses of cellular and tissue heterogeneity. We expect there will be more crossing between proteomics and the non-protein coding work of the ENCODE teams and the mapping of TADs, transcriptional act, uh, active areas, and transcriptional condensates inside cells. We wanna see much more on biomarkers, including not just individual proteins, but complexes and protein isoforms and PTMs. <clears throat> and we wanna have orthogonal confirmation of findings with mass spectrometry, with immunohistochemistry in a way that has been slow to develop, but is now underway. So as, uh, Acknowledgements. I want to, of course, thank my. Oh, how'd that happen? Well, share the screen again. Here we go. Uh, come on, share. Well, I um, want to be sure to show the slide with the acknowledgements. Jesus, I don't know what happened to my sharing. Actually, yes, we can thank see you. your acknowledgement slide. Well, you can. Well, thank yes. you for speaking up. That's so yes. helpful. All right, so the point is, this is a, uh, a global village and the uh, Human Proteome Project has had many, many important players 
and contributing players. There are 25 chromosome teams, 19 biology and disease teams, four resource pillars of the leadership group. Uh, I show the names there. Those are the authors on the Jan January uh, on the uh, uh, JPR paper, um, but the um, at Hikari paper, which I listed earlier, which is the second PMID, has about 150 authors. For University of Michigan colleagues in the CPTAC uh, Analysis Center is Alexei Nezvisky, Arul Chinayan, Marcin Sislik, uh, Mohan Donasekaran, Shandan Kumar, Felipe Leprovost, Brody Mumfrey, and the uh, CPTAC renal cancers. Uh, I just showed here the, the co-first authors and co-senior authors of a very large number. And finally, across all of these CPTAC projects, outstanding leadership from the NCI staff and uh, hundreds and hundreds of CPTAC investigators. It's been a great pleasure to be part of this and we are dedicated for several more years of intensive effort. Thank you all very much for this opportunity. Of course, when we come to the panel, I'll be delighted to address any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Oman. That was really a tour de force. And as someone who was previously part of um, the Johns Hopkins um, CP Tech uh, Proteome um, Characterization Center, um, with the just the mound of data that you've presented, I just can't help but think of the size of all the, the data files that correspond to <laughs> just all the decades of work that you've presented here. So yes, yeah, really a tour de force. So thank you so much. Um, I'm glad you're part of that. It's wonderful. I recognize your name. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have moved on to the panel discussion portion of our symposium. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to add them to the Q&A box. And um, if we don't have any questions yet, I definitely have several. <laughs> um, I will uh, certainly raise, um, I just wanted to mention a question that uh, Dr. Snyder mentioned after uh, Scott's talk. Um, so he wanted to know about the clinical utility of the information that you presented, Scott. Yeah, so that, excellent question. Um, we're so early in DNA adaptomics. Right now, we're trying to collect profiles about patients. Uh, but just to give you a hint of what we are starting to see, uh, so for example, in uh, prostate cancer, uh, there are different gradations, and we see a differentiation of the DNA adapt profiles um, for those uh, two groups of patients. Um, and so the idea is that Perhaps uh, we might be able to use this sort of technology uh, to help guide uh, treatment regime. Uh, some other area uh, that would be interesting is because we're looking at exposures in totality uh, at some point in time, it might be that uh, uh, we're able to uh, profile a sample and get an idea or in, be informed about what they were exposed to. So that's another, uh, another thing um, if it gets to the point of you know, biopsy or uh, some other uh, more invasive um, analyses uh, or dissection and analyses. Uh, but like I say, we uh, we are just starting out, literally in the uh, the broad sense of uh, uh, beginning to ask a lot of these questions right now. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll try not to monopolize the Q&A because I do have so many questions, but- uh, well, so while, question, while we're on Scott, while we're on yes. Scott, let me ask you, because exposomes have become a really popular topic and your yeah. work is very nice. Um, one of the questions is, what about extracellular vesicles? What do we know about them? What do they really represent? And how reliable are they as a source of these analyses? Uh, you know, I don't know, actually. <laughs> uh, we're, we're dealing with... Uh, on the chemical side. Oh, from the chemical side. Uh, honestly, that's not in my purview of research. Uh, I, I don't know much about it. Okay. Certainly, Doug Walker works a lot on this. More from, <clears throat> I think, straight plasma profiling. Yes. A little bit of fat, yeah. <clears throat> would be nice to see what the external exposure is. I, I guess, you know, smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be nice to see what the external exposure is. So the plasma exposure to the DNA addicts correlate all three, I would think. Mm -hmm. in your work at some point, Scott. Yeah. You know, I think uh, there has been some uh, sampling of uh, urinary uh, sources, uh, you know, so looking at 
uh, extractable DNA addicts from a uh, urine sample. So I know that that is in our purview, but I haven't really come across that work, personally speaking. Yeah. So I have a question that I'd like to pose to um, all three of the panelists. So um, all of um, our speakers have, all of you have spoken about different omics, the transcriptomics, uh, proteomics, genomics, um, the exposome, adictome. Um, can each of you comment on how you view the integration of these different data types? And um, how do you, like, does one data type supersede the other? Basically, yeah, just how, what are your views on inter integrating these different types of data? Well, I can go first. We do a lot of this, actually. Um, so when we're trying, from a research standpoint, when we're trying to understand biological systems, we'll look at things at a pathway level. So we'll, for example, see how the genome might be impacting certain biological pathways, the transcriptome, the proteome, metabolome. And the different uh, levels of information give very, very different sorts of information, as you might imagine, uh, where, because not everything happens at the transcriptome, which is what's been traditionally studied. So uh, it's all very complementary now from the, and so you do get a much better picture. We, we have a paper we're putting together actually on early colon cancer using familial adamatosis polyposis as a model system, and we can get a much, much better view by the integrative ohm than we can by any single ohm by a lot. And then the second comment I would say is that um, from the clinical side, there's actually a lot of value in having multiple types of measurements as well. So for example, in the work we've been doing when some of these early signs of disease we picked up, as well as the company I'm involved in, QBio, uh, these, these multi-analytics were actually very, very powerful. You'll see three things that aren't quite right. Like when we caught the early lymphoma, lymphoma we did see in a large spleen, but we also saw several blood markers that were elevated as well. And so the combination was very, very powerful for saying something's not quite right. We see that a lot, actually. So instead of just relying on one test, we think that's a big deal because when people are in the normal range, normal range can be quite a spread. <laughs> and some people, it comes back to what I was saying before, some people's normal range is kind of low. Uh, and then suddenly they jump way up and they're still in the normal. Some people might say, well, they're fine, but they've jumped up, something's going on. And we've seen cases like that where that together with other sorts of information could be very, very indicative that something's off. So I would argue, yeah, these, these different data types together give you, again, it's like looking at a whole puzzle versus just a few pieces. You know, well, that's of course, exactly the strategy for the CPTAC. And I agree with everything Mike just said. Uh, it is notable that protein on that level analysis is necessary in order to measure a lot of the biological functions that can be inferred and predicted from transcripts but not so reliably in some cases. In fact, a standard analysis, sort of in the introduction to each of the CPTAC papers is to show the correlation between transcripts and proteins from the same genes. And in many cases, they're correlated, but in many others, they're not. And they're particularly not in certain uh, tissue types or in certain patients which gets to more and more of the precision oncology that's needed. And I think if we're gonna uh, focus on kinases and kinase substrates and phosphocytes, uh, then we have to do the phosphopeptide analysis. This was not so easy for a long time, but now the methods are much better. The analytical methods are greatly improved. This uh, MS Frager is fantastic. And the, uh, the integration of all these methods is becoming faster and more readily reproducible. And I think it's gonna go into clinical practice once we have enough findings that make a difference in the clinical decision. You know, doctors are curious, but they're not curious very much about things that don't change what they can do for the patient. And I'm a clinician myself. So uh, I think that's fair, that's our challenge. There's, and uh, more and more, Patients are part of the decision-making, which is a great development in modern medicine. And in trying to keep people healthy, it's essential. And in trying to get the proper care for disease states is also very helpful. In fact, there's a whole category of evidence now, which is called patient-reported evidence. That's not even part of the normal clinical record. 
And we have to capture that because a lot of it is very relevant. It's a whole other lecture. But I, I would say that CPTAC is a very good response to your question because it tries to do exactly this notion of, of really integrating and efficiently integrating lots of complex data. Great. So for uh, DNA adductomics, um, one question we we have going forward from now is uh, whether or not we can correlate uh, or not, not necessarily correlate, but uh, look at our genomic information and see whether or not we can use that to inform us about our adductomic or exposure information and vice versa. Um, again, it's just, it's a big question right now that we have and in moving forward, one of our biggest uh, issues is throughput. And so in order to answer some of these questions, we're gonna have to have uh, large experiments, uh, lots of data generated. Um, and so as we develop more robust, um, uh, more precise uh, means to uh, reproduce our DNA adductomics work, uh, we'll be able to better answer some of these uh, um, kind of integrative uh, questions as applied to DNA work or DNA adductomic work. Oh, Bharat, yes. Yeah, I, I just had a, a follow-up question to the panelists. I, I think when I think of the proteogenomics uh, integration or just integration across omics, you know, you could integrate, you know, information from different omic platforms to improve prediction, uh, which is, I think, what Dr. Snyder was talking about um, in his talk. Uh, but then I was wondering whether there were any kind of specific examples uh, that the panelists could point to where, you know, including information from genomics helped in interpretation of some, you know, proteomic finding or vice versa um, that would help us gain some insight into biology. Uh, you know, beyond just the prediction of clinical outcomes? Well, the best example I can think of, of course, comes from my work. <laughs> That's the one I know about. I'm sure there are many other examples out there. Uh, but we actually took uh, autism, which is a complex disease, and we were very interested in trying to find the underlying genetic architecture, which has not been very well exposed. People, you know, there's a few prominent genes like Rett syndrome's cases with methyl um, binding protein, things like that. Uh, and then the other parts are really, really quite poor from GWAS. They really haven't uh, unraveled that. But what we did was we could take rare variants and look for those that might be enriched on protein modules and a protein interaction network. So we, and what we found were two modules. Uh, one was chromatin uh, types of proteins. And another was one that's actually expressed in, of all things, the corpus callosum. And so it was taking two different kinds of information, genomics and proteomics, combining them in a very different way than anybody was doing. And we could actually find all these genes that were involved and they made a lot of biological sense. Everybody had been focused on the cortex for autism. And suddenly we said, well, the corpus callosum actually looks like probably a more prominent role. And it made a lot of sense morphologically, it's different in autism kids. And so uh, it was really quite illuminating to combine things that way. So I think we could use a lot more studies like that. Uh, people always assume you know, genomics fields very locked into very traditional approaches, which is to look for prominent, you know, uh, genes like BRCA that will <laughs> be highly penetrant, or they look for these genes of low, these variants of incredibly low effect and they sum over millions of them. And they're really not taking advantage of the information that's out there from other sources like proteomics or metabolomics and things in ways that could be really quite illuminating. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here, quite frankly. I'll give you two examples. Um, one is sort of related to what Mike just said. This is about Alzheimer's disease, disease, diseases. Surely very heterogeneous, dimensions are very heterogeneous. There are environmental and dietary hypotheses. The prevalent notion about the biology of Alzheimer's diseases has been that it's due to deposition of beta amyloid and that you should treat the beta amyloid deposition, but that has failed completely. And it almost surely means 
that we're barking up the wrong tree, not for evidence of the disease, but for causation of the disease. So one of the other clues that's percolating is that there's epidemiologic evidence of a connection, let's say an association between diabetes type two, diabetes that Mike was talking about extensively and Alzheimer's risk. And that the inflammatory process and some metabolic processes that might be external to the brain might play on Alzheimer's, let's say dementia, cognitive loss syndromes. If that's true, then drugs that could target such pathways and don't penetrate the brain might work outside the brain. It's a wholly different way of even formulating the questions to address in the problem. And it could go many directions from that little comment, but maybe that's enough to just mention it. The other example I wanna give you is from work with um, transcriptomics and then proteins. This came from University of Michigan from a uh, 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 molecular pathologist, partner in the CPTAC also, but head of the Michigan um, uh, Molecular Pathology Center, uh, Arul Chanayan. And this is a paper that appeared in Science in 2005, showing that in prostate cancers, there was a different kind of molecular lesion than just a mutation or a copy number variation or deletion. It was a, what's called a fusion. And what happens is there's a, mini, a micro translation, uh, translocation where the gene for an ordinary protein esterase, TMPRSS2, is targeted into the sequence of a gene for uh, transcription, an ETS family gene, any one of them, or ERG or ETSV and so forth. And the combination now has the promoter from the esterase and the sequence, but not the promoter from the transcription factor. And what's important about this is that promoter from the esterase is under the control of androgen. So androgen, male hormone now drives the expression of the transcription factor and the proliferation, growth and proliferation of the prostate tumors, cancers. And this was not just a rare occurrence. This accounts for about 60% of prostate cancers. So it transformed the strategy for trying to locally attack these pathways in prostate cancers. And there's been progress along those lines. So I would say that's a pretty interesting example where uh, uh, understanding it, not just at the uh, transcript level, but asking new questions about the kinds of changes in the genome and therefore in the proteins. And then, as I said multiple times in my talk, the changes in the proteins, whether it's a different ratio of splice isoforms, which are understudied severely, or uh, important post-translational modifications which change the properties of the protein for secretion or for signaling or for many other or acetylation and ubiquitinylation, all these key pathways. And there are hundreds of kinds of translational, post-translational modifications of proteins, which are just waiting to be exploited for biological significance and clinical significance. Thank you. Great. Um, let's see. All right. So just a reminder to all of the attendees, if you do have any questions, so please um, place those questions in the Q&A box. Um, I think I'll have, I'll ask one more question and then I'll ask, um, I'll give the uh, presenters an opportunity to maybe ask each other questions. Um, so I guess this one, this question, I'll target it more towards uh, Dr. Snyder and Dr. Walmsley, but, um, but feel free to, um, to, to answer, if you will. So I just want to get back to like a topic that, um, that Dr. Snyder was talking about. So the concept of individual versus uh, population-based health and longitudinal um, health like monitoring of health. So you mentioned that for establishing um, a, a person's like, age ohm, um, so you recommending like five measurements like within like two years, and that was kind of um, sufficient to establish like, a good profile for one's aging. And then um, Scott, I know you talked about like, so the exposome. So can both of you just comment on, um, I guess, the recommended frequency of like longitudinal profiling and um, how does one establish like a true baseline for a person's um, health? 
Yeah, well, I don't think we know how often we really should be measuring people, right? I would argue uh, that should depend on what their trajectories look like. Uh, you know, if you started to see things slope go a certain direction, you might take more measurements around those certain in that certain area, and also based on people say genomic uh, risk prediction. So, um, but I don't think we really know. You know, it's kind of funny if you look at studies out there, right? People they recommend colonoscopies at a certain frequency at a certain age, and of course, people sort of follow that, but that's somewhat arbitrary. <laughs> and then in general, there hasn't been that many studies to see what is the frequency with which you'll follow, get certain polyps from certain kinds of individuals with certain kinds of blood markers. It, can we make some correlations to, make, to build better recommendations for how frequently people should get measured? So anyway, I think the whole area is very unexplored if, if you ask me. We're, we're, when we're profiling healthy people, we like to have three baseline measurements just so we know what the fluctuation is. Although we now have a pretty good idea for most, you know, metabolites and, and proteins and such. We we know what the variance is across the individual, generally speaking. But uh, so it's nice to have at least uh, three, but we can get by with two. And so the one could ask, what frequency do you need that at? Well, it probably doesn't matter so much if that's your healthy baseline, because you're trying to find a shift from that. Uh, but then how often to measure someone to look for that shift, I don't know. But I think we'll get into a world where people will be doing blood drop sampling, you know, Theranos that works, uh, that um, could be done, you know, as a home test in some cases for certain assays and as a mail-in test for others. And so then I think the convenience and cost will, you know, enable a much more frequent sampling and thereby, I think, catch disease even earlier. It always comes down to cost, benefit, and convenience. So I think those things would all weigh into play. Right now, medicine is done clunky. You have to go to a doctor's office where most people, you know, a lot of sick people are there. So who wants to go there when you're healthy? Um, I would argue, uh, yeah. So if we could, we can make things a lot more convenient. Uh, we'd probably sample more and catch disease earlier. So, so I think medicine will shift from what we're doing now to something more Amazon-like in the future. Yeah, so in, a, in the world of DNA autonomics, um, it's a huge question, really. I mean, we don't know what our background uh, endogenous adductome profile is. Uh, there's a lot of work that has to be done to determine that. We need to do it in animal models first. Um, the other challenge that we have is persistence um, of particular addicts. We know some addicts um, persist and reproduce and correlate with mutational signatures, for example. Uh, and so therefore, uh, we might better predict going from uh, uh, no disease to disease in concert with the adductome profile. But in other cases, um, the adductome profiles are uh, widely individual uh, and don't correlate with any specific characterization of the patient population. Uh, so it's gonna be very difficult um, to advance uh, on that premise. Now, one other thing, um, uh, and that has to do with uh, how do we detect where these addicts are uh, attaching themselves in the genome? Uh, in some cases, it might be reproducible. Uh, in other cases, in many cases, might not be reproducible. And so uh, there's just now some new developing technology related to nanopore and uh, Pack bio uh, sequencing efforts to uh, start to answer some of those questions. Um, but again, it's highly uh, exposome specific. Um, and some proof of concept that I've seen has only been in a, uh, like a bacterial cell model, for example. So Mike, I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned polygenic risk scores. Uh, one of the really nice examples we've wrote about in the uh, I, uh, ISB papers was uh, looking at polygenic risk score prediction of your expected LDL cholesterol level. So if your level predicted is higher than the level you're at, well then giving you statins might not be very receptive. 
But if your predicted score is for a lower LDL and your actual score on your diet and activity is much higher, then you're a great candidate for bringing it down smartly with statins, presumably. In the first case, maybe you need PCSK9 inhibitor or something more potent. Uh, but uh, is this a guide? Are you using polygenic risk scores in any ways like this for drugs or for other recommendations? No, I think that's really interesting, actually, Gil. And, and I think in some level it makes sense, right? You're already probably mediating it a little bit through, you've got a certain genetic prediction and you're doing some intervention lifestyle. So maybe, maybe it, or some other means. And so maybe you, you're already doing what you can environmentally. So I think it's interesting the, uh, from the way we're using it now, in, in general, it hasn't been in a whole lot of favor. It works when you use it straight up for the genomic side, it works for the top couple percent of people. Like it worked on me, that's how we predicted my type two diabetes. But I'm way out there, I'm a far outlier on the type two diabetes spectrum. It doesn't work that well for people beyond say the first 5%. But then you ask, start adding other markers like you were describing scale, things like this, you can actually add those in to get some better prediction. We've done this for something called abdominal aortic aneurysm, which we've been bringing, doing quite a bit of prediction around. And, and so I, I do think adding other information improves your predictive value. We're not always sure. I thought the observation you said from the, the study you mentioned is really pretty cool. And I think we need more studies like that to see what variables when combined with ge genomics can get better predictive outcomes. And so do you do I, a whole genome sequencing or, or just exomes, exomes sequencing? Well, initially we did exome because it made us go CLIA. And it was at the time we started our IPOP study it was expensive. So we've converted most folks over into whole genome now because it's gotten cheaper. So then we can get the polygenic risk scores. There you go. Yeah, you know, it's a great question. It's, I think it's, it will start having impact. If you look at the literature on polygenic risk scores straight up without other markers with limited other markers, very controversial with some people saying, you know, it's still too early to make good predictions. And other people say, no, the time has come for cardiovascular disease for a few key areas. So I think we're right on the bubble here where, where again, cardiovascular disease, I think the case is getting more and more compelling. Well, I'd be really interested in the aortic aneurysm because uh, I know, and since we're talking personally, I, for my case, I get an annual uh, MRI to check the uh, thoracic aorta diameter. And I'd sort of like to know what my predicted. Well, is. send me your genome. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> there you go. Send me your genome. I'll, I'll have our guy who did all that work. He's still in the lab. So let's have him see how you fare. <laughs> Terrific. I'll open it up to the other 38 participants, too. If you want to know about your AAA risk score, by all means, send it. That, that one's mostly based on rare variants, although we have some new analysis methods coming out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. It's been definitely a very uh, stimulating conversation here. And um, I will, um, yeah, thank all the speakers, but I'll turn it over to Bharat for some closing remarks. Well, I wanted to thank uh, all the speakers for a uh, very stimulating talks and very thought provoking discussion uh, now. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for moderating uh, the session. And uh, thank you for everyone for attending. and sticking with us for three hours so all right see very you very good thank, thank you for pleasure thanks bye. for having us very good bye bye, bye. bye.